Hello, this is Christopher Reeve. I'm very happy to be able to share with you my book, Still Me, on audio. The spoken word, storytelling, if you will, has always been important to me. From my fourth grade teacher who taught us to love stories by recording them and playing them aloud in the classroom, to my mother who read audiobooks professionally and with whom my brother and I spent many nights reading aloud, to my work as an actor and in my early days in the hospital when listening to my wife read letters from friends was literally a lifeline for me. Now this audiobook allows me to communicate with you in a very personal way, second only to being in the same room. So I'm very grateful for the power of the spoken word, and I thank you very much for listening. Still me. A few months after the accident, I had an idea for a short film about a quadriplegic who lives in a dream. During the day, lying in his hospital bed, he can't move, but at night he dreams that he's whole again. This is someone who'd been a lifelong sailor, and he had a beautiful gaff-rigged sloop. Not like my boat, the Sea Angel, which was modern and made of fiberglass. In his dream, he sails down the path of a full moon, the kind of romantic night sailing anyone can imagine. But in the morning, he's back in his bed, and everything is frozen again. The dream is very vivid, and at first it's just a dream, and he recognizes it as such. But one night, he finds himself getting out of bed, walking down the corridor and out the door, and then into the boat, which magically is anchored not far away. Soon these voyages become so real to him that when he wakes up, his hair is wet. The nurse comes in and says, Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't dry your hair enough last night when I gave you a shampoo. You slept with wet hair. He says nothing, but he's thinking that his hair is wet from the spray when he was out on the water. One time he comes back still wearing his foul weather gear and he has to hide it in the hospital room closet. Now his wife and children have been very distressed because since he became paralyzed, he hasn't been able to pull out of a very serious depression. His children are afraid of him because he's not himself and they don't know how to be with him. But as he continues to go sailing in his dreams, his mood begins to improve. His wife notices the change he thinks he may be losing his mind, but his dreams are making their life together happier. He sails in Tenants Harbor, or a similarly idyllic spot like that in Maine, and there's an older man there who always turns on the light in his cabin down by the water when our man is sailing. He doesn't sleep very well, and he never misses a chance to see the boat sailing so beautifully in the moonlight. There comes a time in our story when our protagonist realizes that these voyages offer a way of escaping from his paralyzed condition, that he could just sail on happily. It's what he loves most in the world. Until one night he would go out in the middle of the ocean and he wouldn't take supplies. He would just sail. And he would die happy that way, just sailing down the path of the moon. And one night he starts to do that. But then out at sea he starts to think about what he has in his life, how grateful he is for his wife and children. Because during the days, you see, he's changed. His kids are less afraid of him, and they're playing with him, and his wife, well, they're clearly still in love. So he turns the boat around and goes straight to the dock of the older man who's always loved this boat. And when the old man comes down to greet him, our man says, here, this is for you. And then he goes back to the hospital and he wakes up, a quadriplegic again, but he has an entirely new basis for the future with his family and towards recovery. That's the gist of it. Of course, the story comes from my experience, but it's not my story. I'm different from this man because my family saved me at the very beginning.
when a catastrophe happens, it's easy to feel so sorry for yourself that you can't even see anybody around you. But the way out is to focus more on what your little boy needs or what your teenagers need, and it's very hard to do. But that's the answer to the dilemma of being frozen. Well, at least it's the answer I found. And yet these dreams of being able to move and live again in your former life can be very real, very powerful. And it's always a shock in the morning when you wake up and realize where you are. You think, this can't be my life, there's been a mistake. It took a lot of adjustment. It still does. On Memorial Day 1995, I was headed down to Culpeper, Virginia with my horse Buck to compete in a combined training event. I was getting to be a pretty good rider. I'd taken up the sport about 10 years earlier when I was cast as a captain in the cavalry in a film of Anna Karenina and wanted to do some of my own riding. I'd been allergic to horses since childhood, but to prepare for the part, I loaded up with antihistamines and took daily lessons. By the end of a month, I could walk, trot, canter, and gallop fairly respectably. I went off to Budapest in the fall of 1984 to begin filming and quickly discovered that the other riders in the movie were members of the Hungarian National Equestrian Team. One of the highlights of the story is a steeplechase. I didn't feel quite ready, to say the least, to jump four-foot hedges at 25 miles an hour, but I did feel prepared to gallop on the flat along with the team rather than use a double. The whole experience was absolutely exhilarating, and now I was bitten by the riding bug. When I came home, I decided to take up the sport properly. I began to train at a small barn in Bedford, New York, where we have our home today, and to build up time in the saddle with good friends in Williamstown, Massachusetts, where I often appeared at the theater festival. By 1989, I'd progressed to the point where I could compete in combined training events. This aspect of the sport appealed to me because it has three phases, dressage, stadium jumping, and cross-country jumping. The challenge is to develop such a strong bond between horse and rider that you can succeed in the very precise maneuvers and tight control of the dressage ring, and then take sizable jumps at a gallop out in the woods a few hours later which requires speed, accuracy, and confidence. I had various sources over the years, and whenever I went on a film location, I always found the best trainer in the area and took lessons. I had the benefit of working with some of the best riders and teachers in the country. Mark Weisbecker, Brian Sabo, Mike Huber, Stephen Bradley, and Yves Sauvignon, to name a few. My allergies disappeared, I was smitten with riding and wanted to do it as well as I could. But I always kept in mind the advice of my first flying instructor, Robert Hall, just after I received my license. The successful outcome of any maneuver must never be seriously in doubt. As an avid sports enthusiast, particularly attracted to activities that some would consider risky or even dangerous, this became almost a mantra. In the fall of 1994, I was filming Village of the Damned in Northern California, but I was desperate to compete in one more combined training event before the season was over. So I caught a plane back east and went up to Mark Weisbecker's barn in the Berkshires, where he'd been training my Irish thoroughbred Denver while I was away. On Saturday, I took Denver over to the meet at Stoneley Burnham, but as we started the cross-country phase, I was not happy with the way he took the first four jumps. In the interest of safety, I retired from the course, rather than risk injury in the quest for a prize. I was a good sailor, having raced or cruised in all kinds of sailboats from the age of seven. I had flown various airplanes for over 20 years and made two solo trips across the Atlantic. I would raced sailplanes. I enjoyed scuba diving, played tennis, and was a skier as well. I never felt that I was courting danger, because I always stayed within my self-imposed limits. 
in all aspects of my life, I enjoyed being in control, which is why my accident was a devastating shock, not only to me, but to everyone who knew me. The fact that I went to Culpeper at all was a last minute fluke. I'd originally signed up to compete that weekend at an event up in Vermont. I'd had success in Vermont the year before. I finished first in one event at Tamarack and placed third in the Area 1 Championships in the fall of 94. And I preferred the cool weather. I figured that on Memorial Day weekend it'd be more pleasant in Vermont than in Virginia. I also knew that this event would be the last one I could do for the season because I was about to go to Ireland to act in Kidnapped, produced by Francis Ford Coppola and directed by Yvonne Posser. I'd made arrangements to train with one of the top event riders in Ireland. I was very excited about that, and I was going to be riding in the movie, too. So my plan was to do one more event on my new horse Eastern Express, nicknamed Buck, whom I'd bought in California during the shoot of Village of the Damned. He was a 12-year-old American thoroughbred with a lot of experience in combined training. In fact, he and his previous owner had been coached by Brian Sabo. Brian recommended the horse to me, describing him as a fearless jumper, both in cross-country and stadium, big enough to carry me, though not a star in dressage. He was a light chestnut gelding with a very sweet disposition. I felt the Denver's tendency to knock down rails in the show jumping phase meant I would probably not be able to move him up to the higher levels of competition. But Buck had experience and a lot of mileage left in him. So I brought him back east after I finished the film and worked with Lendon Gray, one of the top dressage coaches in the country, whose barn is near our home in Bedford. By January, I was taking blue ribbons at local dressage shows and getting higher scores than I ever had before. My plan was to spend the 95 season with Buck, doing training level events, and then move up to preliminary in 96. In training level, the jumps are never more than three foot six, and the combinations are not too difficult. But the preliminary level is much more demanding. I wanted to be careful, to do everything steadily and safely, but make progress. At an event in Massachusetts, just a couple of weeks before the accident, Buck was stunning going cross-country. He just ate the course up. He had a ball, and so did I. That was very encouraging to me, because we'd missed some practice time and a couple of events in April. Once he had a sore back, another time he had an abscess in his foot, which kept me off him for more than ten days just at the time when I would ordinarily be shifting into high gear in preparation for the season. Perhaps I should have seen these as warning signs, but he seemed to enjoy going cross-country so much, and our partnership seemed so solid that I thought we were well enough prepared. In April, I'd moved to another barn in the Bedford area and was reunited with my first coach, Bill McGinnis, Bill ran the only combined training barn and had a group of half a dozen loyal clients. They'd all decided to go to Culpeper for the Memorial Day weekend, and Bill invited me to come along to help keep everybody's expenses down. And I knew from experience that it's more fun to compete as a group, so I agreed to go and put in an entry at the last minute. I've since learned that this sort of impulsive decision is typical of many accidents. At the last minute, someone decides to get in another car or take an earlier flight. And I've often thought that if I'd stuck to the original plan, nothing bad would have happened. But, as my wife Dana pointed out, if we'd gone sailing that weekend instead, I could just as easily have been hit in the head by the boom, knocked overboard, and drowned. An accident can happen at any time, even to someone who's cautious and in control. In the spring of 95, Dana, a wonderful singer and actress, had several auditions she needed to prepare for. 
I was writing a lot and helping to rewrite the script for Kidnapped. And there were other things. My work for the Creative Coalition, TCC, a public service organization which I served as co-president. And there were social obligations, personal appearances and speeches. This weekend was intended to be a mini vacation before going back to work. The plan was that I would drive down to Virginia, Buck would go in the big trailer with the other horses, and Dana would take our son Will to Washington by train and then rent a car because we thought he would enjoy the adventure. We stayed at the Holiday Inn not far from the fairgrounds, which had a pool and a grassy area where the three of us could kick around a soccer ball. I arrived ahead of them on Friday in time to practice that afternoon. That night, we all had an early dinner at the Holiday Inn. Staying in a motel was a big deal for Will, who was nearly three. I got up early on that Saturday morning. At the end of the dressage, I was in fourth place out of 27. I went back to the Holiday Inn to spend time with Dana and Will. And then around one, I changed into my cross-country equipment and headed back for the fairgrounds. I went out and walked the course again. I'd already done it twice the day before, but I walked it one more time. The first six jumps seemed very easy. You walk a cross-country course to decide how you're going to take the jumps, where you're going to gallop, where you're going to slow down and show jump it. When I arrived back at the stables, I ran into John Williams, an advanced level rider and trainer and a good friend. I told him that I liked the course and was glad I'd come to Virginia, that I had a great new horse and was looking forward to a good ride. He wished me luck. From that moment until I regained consciousness several days later in the intensive care unit at the University of Virginia, I have no memory of what occurred. Later, as I tried to reconstruct the sequence of events, I was told that I finished suiting up, got Buck out of the stall, and headed out for the warm-up area. There were three practice jumps, and the warm-up went fine. I left the starting box at exactly 3.01. Witnesses said that Buck was absolutely willing and ready. First jump, no problem. The second jump was a medium-sized log pile, no problem. Then we came to the zigzag. The fence judge's report says that I was going fast, not excessively fast, but moving right along. Apparently, Buck started to jump the fence, but all of a sudden, he just put on the brakes. No warning, no indication, no hesitation, no sense of anything wrong. He just stopped. It was what riders call a dirty stop. It just occurs without warning. Someone said that a rabbit ran out and spooked Buck. Someone said it could have been shadows. When I went over, I took the bridle off Buck's face. The bridle, the bit, the reins, everything. And I landed right on my head because my hands were entangled in the bridle and I couldn't get an arm free to break my fall. I flipped over slumping down on the other side of the fence. My helmet prevented any brain damage, but the impact of the landing broke my first and second vertebrae. This is called a hangman's injury because this break is what happens when the trap door opens and the noose snaps tight. It was as if I'd been hanged and then cut down and sent to a hospital. I was heard to say, I can't breathe. And that was it. Buck probably ducked his head right after he stopped. This often happens. The horse puts his head down because the rider's coming forward and he wants to get away from the weight. As you go over a jump, you're supposed to stay in the center of the horse. In fact, you should always be in the center of your horse. But if you're both committed to the jump and then he suddenly refuses, it's very hard to stop your forward momentum, especially if you're well off his back the way you're supposed to be when you go cross-country. 
And in order to protect Buck's back, I was actually riding with my stirrups a little higher than usual. My hands probably got caught in the bridle because I was making every effort to stay on. If you fall off during the cross-country ride, you lose 60 points and have no chance of placing in the competition. If my hands had been free, my guess is I would have broken a wrist. Or I would have just rolled over and gotten up, cursed quietly to myself, and then just hopped back on. Instead, I came straight down on the top rail of the jump, hyperextended my neck, and slumped down in a heap. Head first, six feet four inches and 215 pounds of me, straight down on the rail. Within seconds, I was paralyzed and not breathing. For more than a year, I wondered if my injury was purely an accident or if I was responsible for what happened to me. Rabbit or no rabbit, shadows or no shadows, I think I may have done something to cause the accident, and I have to take responsibility for it. I may have moved forward before I should have, which is an easy mistake to make. On the other hand, it shouldn't have been enough to cause Buck to stop. But I've learned that to speculate endlessly about what happened serves no purpose other than to torment myself. Regardless of exactly what happened, I know now that I can't relive the event forever. If I made a mistake, I've got to forgive myself for being human. I'm in the process of doing that now. I only fell a few feet, but I shattered my first cervical vertebra as I landed on the top rail of the jump. The second vertebra was also broken, but not so badly. And then I was fighting for air like a drowning person. It's possible that as I twisted my head and fought for air that the broken shards of my first vertebra and the broken part of the second vertebra were cutting and damaging nerves in the spinal cord. I was probably my own worst enemy at that point. By the time the paramedics arrived at the scene, I hadn't breathed for three minutes. Apparently I was still conscious and later they described me as combative. But I'm very lucky they reached me so quickly because after four minutes of not breathing, brain damage begins. Dana was always there when I competed, usually stationed at the more difficult jumps, but this time she was still back at the Holiday Inn where Will was waking up from his nap. Suddenly the phone rang. It was Peter Lazar, one of our group, and the first thing he said was, Now don't panic. Dana asked, What happened? She's a doctor's daughter and not one to panic easily. When he said Chris had a spill, it occurred to Dana that this is the sort of language that people use to minimize situations. Then Peter added, I don't know why, but they had to take him off the field on a stretcher. Dana took Will, drove to the Culpeper Hospital, and found the emergency room. Then she saw a helicopter landing outside with the word Pegasus written on it, and she thought, that's not for a broken arm. Two nurses came out and told Dana that the doctor wanted to see her in his office. Dr. Maloney, the admitting physician at the ER, came into the office and said he was very worried about me. Will was sitting in Dana's lap, and as Dr. Maloney was giving her the details of my injury, she felt like she was being knocked backwards with every blow. I broke the top two cervical vertebrae, C1 and C2. I was having trouble breathing. I was on a respirator. After each new piece of information, Dana took a breath and said, Okay, okay, okay. Will was sitting there squeezing Dana's nose with his finger so that she would say beep. It was one of his favorite games. He did that as Dana was hearing the most devastating news of her life. She was very confused. If I was on a respirator, that meant I was practically dead. But they were just keeping me breathing. She knew nothing about broken necks. She didn't understand how it all fit together. 
Well, she said, I have to call my father. She needed a translation. Amazingly, Chuck Morosini was at home that Memorial Day weekend. She told him, Chris has had a serious riding accident. It's a neck injury. Her father said, oh, God. She knew immediately that, oh, God, meant that my life was hanging in the balance. The people at Culpepper said that Dana should see me before the helicopter took off because it might be for the last time. Dana had to collect Will, try not to frighten him with what was happening, and check out of the hotel. How she got through that afternoon, I have no idea. Then she and Will drove through the University of Virginia as I was being flown there in a helicopter named for a flying horse. When Dana arrived at UVA, a doctor who told her to call him Mo came in and sat down and repeated much of what she'd heard at Culpepper. But he was the first one who said, there's a chance he may never breathe on his own. Dana said it was like being slammed into a wall. She met with the chief of neurosurgery, Dr. John Jane, and Dr. Scott Henson, his second in command. They told her I was extremely lucky to have survived the accident. I was on morphine and Versed, completely snowed. I had no idea of my situation. Even when I was awake, I was still unaware. But I was extremely lucky to have come under the care of Dr. Jane. In addition to his hospital position as chief of neurosurgery, he is chairman of the Department of Neurological Surgery at the University of Virginia Medical School. He is lectured and taught all over the world. His curriculum vitae is roughly the size of a county telephone directory, listing accomplishments that seem too numerous for a single lifetime. It was just my great good fortune that he was at the hospital when I arrived, that he took control of my care and agreed to operate on me himself. At the small county hospital in Culpeper, little could be done for me. But fortunately, the doctors there had methylprednisolone, MP, and administered it to me immediately. MP is a synthetic steroid, which must be given within eight hours of the injury to have any effect. Doctors discovered in the 1980s that it can help fight the inflammation that occurs immediately after a lesion in the spinal cord. Not only does the victim suffer the damage caused by the initial trauma, but the entire central nervous system starts going down like a row of dominoes. The inflammation, which in my case extended down to the seventh cervical vertebra, causes the breakdown of fats into unstable compounds called free radicals that are like acid to cell tissues. In other words, healthy nerves below the site of the injury are being eaten alive causing further loss of sensation and motor function. But in most patients, MP can reduce this inflammation by about 20%, preventing some of this additional damage. This 20% can mean the difference between patients breathing on their own instead of spending life hooked up to a ventilator. As soon as I arrived at UVA, Dr. Jane had me stabilized to prevent any more compression in the spine. Compression causes electrical impulses attempting to travel through the injured area to go haywire, which causes the death of even more nerve cells. As these cells die, another wave of destruction sweeps from the damaged site and radiates outward. Immune cells flood in, and in a frenzied attempt to clear away the accumulated debris, begin to chew up damaged and healthy nerves alike. So as the victim of a spinal cord injury at the C2 level lies immobilized and unconscious, inflammation and compression are steadily destroying the essential functions of the body, breathing, bladder, bowel control, sexual response, and any motion below the neck. Only the heart and the brain continue to function normally. Dr. Jane had me placed on a bed and screwed a metal structure into my head just above the temples. Then he attached a heavy weight behind it to keep me immobile. I was hooked up to machines that monitored my heart rate, pulse, blood pressure, and oxygen saturation levels, or SATs. 
I continued to drift in and out of consciousness. My lungs had begun to fill up with fluid, making me very susceptible to pneumonia. In the past, doctors had no way of removing liquid from the lungs, and at this stage a patient would usually die. I had pneumonia in one lung, but they managed to clear the infection with powerful antibiotics and by repeated suctioning, a very unpleasant experience. After five days, I became fully conscious. Anson and Jane came in to explain my situation. They told me that after the pneumonia cleared from my lungs, they would have to operate to reconnect my skull to the top of my spine. They didn't know if the operation would be successful, or even if I could survive it. Dana had insisted, over the objections of some of the family, that the doctors discuss everything with me personally, and that nothing be done without my consent. I answered somewhat vaguely, Well, okay, whatever you have to do. I'd always recovered quickly from physical setbacks, and over time I coped successfully with the emotional challenges in my life as well, such as my parents' divorce. So at first I thought this was just another temporary problem. It was only after the doctors left that I had the horrible realization that this was different. This is not a C5, C6, which means you're in a wheelchair, but you can use your arms and breathe in your own. C1, C2 is about as bad as it gets. Dana came into the room. She knelt down next to me and we made eye contact. And then I mouthed my first lucid words to her. Maybe we should let me go. Dana started crying. She said, I'm only going to say this once. I will support whatever you want to do because this is your life and your decision. But I want you to know that I'll be with you for the long haul, no matter what. And then she added the words that saved my life. You're still you, and I love you. I think if she'd looked away or paused or hesitated even slightly, or if I'd felt there was a sense of her being, being what, noble? Or fulfilling some obligation to me? I don't know if I could have pulled through. Because it had dawned on me that I was going to be a huge burden to everybody, that I had ruined my life and everybody else's. The best thing to do would be to slip away. But what Dana said made living seem possible because I felt the depth of her love and commitment. I was even able to make a little joke. I mouthed, this is way beyond the marriage vows in sickness and in health. And she said, I know. I knew then and there that she was going to be with me forever. My job would be to learn how to cope with this and not be a burden. I would have to find new ways to be productive again. A day or two later, my two older children came over from England. Matthew, 15, and Alexandra, 11. My children with Gay Exton. I had met Gay when I was shooting the first two Superman films in London. Although we'd never married, we'd been together for nearly 10 years, until an amicable split in February of 1987. Dana had called them and they flew over right away. As they gathered around me all, putting on their bravest faces, I understood in an instant how much they needed me. In spite of the terrible condition I was in, I could see how glad they were that I was still alive. Despite the ugly equipment that kept me immobilized, each one of them managed to touch me or give me a gentle hug. Afterwards, out in the hallway, Will asked his mom if I'd be able to walk. Would I still be able to play soccer with him? She answered, We don't know, sweetheart, but maybe not. Will thought about this for a moment and then concluded cheerfully, Well, he can still smile. My mother had come down from Princeton. She saw me unconscious and immobilized, and she was told that I only had a slim chance of survival. She became distraught and began arguing strenuously that the doctor should pull the plug. She knew what an active life I'd always led, 
how unbearably difficult it would be for me not being able to move. In the past, I would have agreed with her. At one point, my mother told Dana's father, tomorrow we're going to do it. Chuck Morosini replied, you're not doing anything. They had a terrible argument. In my ICU room, I was protected from the controversy outside. My younger brother, Ben, who'd come down from Boston, sided with Dana and Chuck, and together they persuaded my mother to calm down. Dana continued to take care of everything. She conferred with my agent, Scott Henderson, and my publicist, Lisa Costeller. Ben held a short press conference the day after my operation, while Dana contacted more of our relatives all over the country. How she held everything together during those days, I don't know. But a lot of what she did was for Will's benefit. She tried to keep him from seeing the calamity written on everybody's face. Her inner strength and her ability to cope with the situation still seems amazing to me. In the days before the operation, I had quite a few visitors. One of the first was Gregory Moser, who was producing the film American Buffalo with Dustin Hoffman. Greg and I had been good friends for my days as an acting student at Juilliard. Over the years, we'd lost touch, but when he heard about the accident on the radio, he dropped everything to come see me. My parents, divorced for many years, were both with me. As the day of the operation drew closer, I lay on my back, frozen, unable to avoid thinking the darkest thoughts. And then, at an especially bleak moment, the door flew open and in hurried a squat fellow with a blue scrub hat and a yellow surgical gown and glasses, speaking in a Russian accent. He announced that he was my proctologist and that he had to examine me immediately. My first reaction was that either I was on way too many drugs or that I was in fact brain damaged. But it was Robin Williams. He and his wife, Marcia, had materialized from who knows where. And for the first time since the accident, I laughed. My old friend had helped me know that somehow I was going to be okay. And then he said he would do anything for me. I thought, my God, maybe it can be okay. I mean, life's going to be very different, and it's going to be an enormous challenge. But I can still laugh, and there's still some joy. I began to understand that there's so much love waiting to be shown. As a person who tended towards privacy and keeping my feelings to myself, I'm not sure I ever understood that before. After 10 days in intensive care, I was ready for the operation. My lungs had cleared. I had no idea that the kind of surgery they would perform on me had never been done before. Dr. Jane had to reattach my head to my spinal column without causing brain damage while giving me the possibility of movement. He placed wires under both lamina, the bony covering of the spinal cord. He took bone from my hip and squeezed it down to get a solid fit between C1 and C2. And he put in a titanium pin the shape of a small croquet wicket and fused the sublaminal wires with the first and second vertebrae. And finally, he drilled holes in my skull and passed the wires through to get a solid fusion. What Jane did, in short, was to put my head back on my body. Few operations are as perilous as those dealing with a C1, C2 injury. 31 pairs of nerves sprout from the spinal cord. Closest to the brain are the eight cervical nerves that process information to the neck, shoulders, arms, and hands. Before the operation, I could only move my head, but head-turning muscles are controlled by nerves within the brain and not the spinal cord. A year later, I was able to shrug my shoulders and breathe on my own for short periods of time meaning that nerves at the level of my first, second, and third cervical vertebrae had begun to function again. Most spinal cord patients can expect to descend, that is to recover function, two levels below their injury. 
And that's about where I am now. The movement of my biceps may come if nerves of the fifth cervical vertebrae recover. Some hand function would come with the sixth, triceps with the seventh, and with the eighth, more hand functions, those involved in picking up a knife and fork. If nerves at C11 were restored, I could move my torso, and control of my hips and legs it would return with recovery of nerves in the five lumbar vertebrae. But all of this will require tremendous progress in spinal cord research. As of now, no C1, C2 has ever progressed beyond the C4 level. Without nerves working in the sacral area of the spinal cord, I cannot control bowel or bladder movements and have little sexual function aside from involuntary contractions. And yet I'm very lucky. If the paramedics hadn't arrived so quickly, if I'd come to UVA when Dr. Jane was away, if I'd had a less brilliant surgeon, if I had gone to compete in Vermont and suffered the same injury, I would not have survived. Everyone took turns reading me the mail. There was a genuine outpouring of affection coming from very unexpected places, and it buoyed me up. I would get through the day carried by those letters and that love. Dana would come in with that beautifully clear voice of hers and sing harmony. We'd always loved making music together. In the evenings, I'd watch the Stanley Cup finals. There was always somebody visiting me, and Dana and Will were staying just down the hall. I was so grateful that Will didn't seem to be uncomfortable or afraid of me. He'd come in, and I'd be connected to all kinds of IVs and tubes and hoses with a tracheotomy tube coming out of my throat like the one I have now. But Will could look past all that and see me. He would climb up on the bed and get comfortable, and we'd watch the hockey games together. If he'd avoided me or seemed scared or had been afraid to touch me, I would have felt utterly rejected. But Will's shiny little face coming through the door to spend time with me was a great lift. As I was recovering from the operation, Dr. Jane and his team came in to assess my condition. They prick you with a safety pin to test for possible motor response, and they brush you with a Q-tip to evaluate sensation. These tests help them determine what your prognosis is likely to be. Some doctors believe that what you come out with after the operation basically remains your condition for the rest of your life. Others say that you can get recovery 18 months down the line. One doctor told me that five years after the operation, one of his patients suddenly could move his foot. The spinal cord is such a strange and unpredictable thing, and people's responses are so unique that two individuals with the same injury can have entirely different results. I heard about two patients in the same room at the same hospital with the same injury. One ended up walking, and the other did not. The person relating the story concluded that one patient had more faith than the other. It's tempting to believe that, and I do think a positive attitude helps tremendously in recovery. But I'm not sure if it's science or faith that ultimately goes the distance. Dr. Jane's a very kind man, practically central casting's idea of a doctor. He's in his 60s and sort of stocky, with a gentle face. I got the feeling that he so wanted me to be better off than I was, that whenever he came to talk to me after the operation, he would sugarcoat the situation a little. He would say that I was incomplete. A C1 incomplete means that the spinal cord is still intact and one can expect more recovery over time. Complete means there will be no further recovery because the spinal cord has been transected or so badly damaged that there's no hope for repair. Dr. Jane said I'd probably descend a couple of levels. He said there was a very good chance I would get off the vent because the phrenic nerve, which controls the impulse to breathe, was intact and the diaphragm hadn't been damaged. 
I felt uplifted by all this. My spirits during those days were on a roller coaster ride. There were moments when I'd feel so grateful, when a friend would come a long way to be with me, and my family, of course, and the letters still pouring in. I used to love to listen to the people in the letters. But the time would come when everybody would have to go. I'd be given a sleeping pill at about 10.30, but by one or two it would wear off. I'd wake up and be staring at everything. Staring at the wall, staring at myself, staring at the future, staring in disbelief. The thought that kept going through my mind was, I've ruined my life. I thought that not only I'd ruined my own life, but everybody else's as well. And for some reason, I didn't get my hands down and break my fall. I'm an idiot. I've spoiled everything. I was still in a state of disbelief and very afraid. A large part of the fear was because I couldn't take a single breath on my own. And the connections of the hoses on these ventilators are tenuous at best. The nurses put tape over the joints, but they don't always hold very well. And you lie there at three in the morning in fear of a pop-off when the hose just comes off the ventilator. After you've missed two breaths, an alarm sounds. You just have to hope that someone will come very quickly. Turn on the lights, figure out where the break is, and put it back together. But it's not like holding your breath underwater. I can't hold my breath. When I exhale, the breath is gone. So when you have a pop-off, there's no air in your lungs, which means you can last a couple of minutes. But those are very, very anxious minutes. The nurse's station was not far away, but the feeling of helplessness was hard to take. Becoming completely dependent on other people is a terrible adjustment to make. I lay there for a month, floating among various moods and feelings, gratitude, horror, self-pity, confusion, anger. There was one doctor at UVA who was the bane of my existence. She came in at all hours of the day and night to poke and prod. She would talk to me as if I were a three-year-old. Finally, I couldn't stand it anymore. I yelled, fuck you, I'm a 42-year-old man. You treat me like one or don't you come in this room again. Well, that chastened her a little bit. I knew she intended me no harm or discomfort, but she increased my feelings of despair and loss and humiliation and embarrassment. I know it may sound odd that I felt humiliation and embarrassment, but those are the emotions I tend to feel whenever something goes seriously wrong in my life. On my first flight across the Atlantic, I was given an incorrect ground speed readout by a radar controller in Greenland. If his information had been accurate, I would have run out of fuel 200 miles west of Iceland and crash-landed in the ocean at night. I expected to die, and my first thought was, I've done something stupid, and it'll be really inconvenient for people. The same thought occurred to me when this injury happened. How embarrassing. Back in the Superman years, I always used to joke about needing to be very careful because I didn't want to read a headline in the New York Post, like, Superman hit by school bus. This accident was humiliating and embarrassing. I shouldn't have let this happen. There were physical therapists in the ICU. About a week after the surgery, they began to move my head a little with isometric pressure, even though I was still in a collar all the time. And then there was the ordeal of getting up. They would slide me into a wheelchair and sit me up very slowly, taking my blood pressure the whole time because as I sat up, my body was too weak to force the blood back up into the heart. Then I'd be wheeled down the hall to the little visiting room. I could look out the window at the trees, 
nice change of view from the rooftops that I could see from my room. The days were tolerable, but the nights were still awful. I would torment myself, my head full of fear and self-recrimination. I never called a nurse in just to say, I'm lonely and I'm upset. I didn't know how to do that. I assumed they had other more important things to do. When I would finally fall asleep, I'd be whole again. I'd go off and do wonderful things. I'd be riding again, or I'd be with Dana and Will, or I'd be acting in a play. And then suddenly I'd wake up and look at the upper right-hand corner of my room and see the screen with all my vitals going across it. My heart rate and blood pressure and oxygen sets. And I'm thinking, I'm tied to all of this and I can't get free. I'm tied, I'm grounded. I won't be able to fly, won't be able to sail, won't be able to ride, won't be able to ski, won't be able to make love to Dana, won't be able to throw a ball to Will, won't be able to do a fucking thing. I'm just taking up space. It's three in the morning, there's no help. I was afraid to have the bed turned away from the monitor with the heart rate and the sats on it. I became terrified if I went below, about 97%. I thought, oh no, the sats are going to drop. I won't be able to breathe, I'm going to die. They won't come in here and fix me. They won't be able to do anything for me. My thoughts would get more and more paranoid and out of control. When I was a kid, my great heroes were Harry Houdini and Charles Lindbergh. Lindbergh because he did something against overwhelming odds. On a couple of tuna fish sandwiches and sheer determination, he flew for 33 hours across the ocean. Imagine staying awake and flying an airplane nonstop for 33 hours. And Harry Houdini, you put him in a straitjacket and he could contort his shoulders and get out of it. Sometimes at three in the morning, I'd think, my whole body's in a straitjacket. I can't move anything. I can't contort my shoulders. This isn't a trick. There's nothing I can do with my body. I'm just lying here in this bed, staring at the monitor. I'd try to go back to sleep, but it wouldn't work, and I'd start to think again. This can't be me. Why me? There's got to be a mistake. Oh, God, I'm trapped. I'm in prison. I've got a life sentence here. I'm never going to get out of this. What am I going to do with myself? I'm 42. I've got no life. I'm going to be a charity case. Somebody, please let me out. Just let me out. I was barely coping. I tried to focus on all the love and support that was coming to me. But much of the time, I thought to myself, I don't care if anybody likes me or doesn't like me. I want to walk. I'll trade all of this affection just to walk up a flight of stairs. The body and mind in trying to survive can be totally selfish. You say, screw the rest of the world, take care of me. Me first. And then you need to evolve to higher thoughts. I'm not a religious person. But I thought, I have to develop a relationship with God right now, otherwise I'm lost. My friend Bobby Kennedy, son of the late Robert F. Kennedy, once said to me, just fake it till you make it. The prayers will seem phony, but one day they'll become real and your faith will become real. But something different happened to me. I began to think, whether there is a God or there isn't a God is not so important. The spirituality itself, the belief that there's something greater than ourselves, that's enough. Dana was going through the same process. After my injury, she read, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, written by Rabbi Harold Kushner, a man whose son had a terrible disease in which the victim ages rapidly and dies in adolescence. 
And so here was a man of God who couldn't reconcile the fact that this could happen to him. But he finally reached the conclusion that both Dana and I could accept that God doesn't make these things happen. We were given free will and everything obeys the laws of nature. If you're flung over a horse's head, you very well might break your neck. It just happens. But where God comes in, where grace enters, is in the strength you find to deal with it. You may not know where it comes from, but there's an enormous power at work. And I think that old phrase, God is love, is literally true. Whether or not you actually believe in God. Thinking that way helped me get past the me, me, me. My body, my problems, myself. Three weeks after the operation, it was time to think about rehab. People had told me that the rehab facility is important, but that it's even more important to be near people you care about. This pointed to the Kessler Institute for Rehabilitation in West Orange, New Jersey. My mother's in Princeton. Dana and Will were in Bedford, only an hour away. Almost everybody else in my family lives in New England, except for my half-brother Mark, who lives in Oregon, and my sister Alia in New Mexico. One day in late June, Dr. Mark Lisipsky, the director of the spinal cord unit at Kessler, came down with the pulmonologist, Dr. Doug Green, to see if I was ready for rehab. Dr. Sipsky used her safety pin and prodded around. I could feel along my shoulders and I had a little feeling in the bottom of my left foot. Otherwise, nothing. I really couldn't feel anything below my shoulder blades. And then Dr. Sivsky said, I need to see whether you're complete or incomplete. I told her I'd been classified as incomplete, but she replied that she needed to do her own assessment. She inserted a rectal tube, but I felt absolutely nothing. Then she made the pronouncement, well, you're a C2 complete. This was devastating to me. How could Dr. Jane and the people at UVA keep telling me I'm incomplete and I'm going to descend to C4 and I'll get off the vent and my phrenic nerve is working? I felt such loss, such confusion, such a sense of doom. Maybe all of them had been playing a kind of game with me so I wouldn't get too despondent. I felt I'd been betrayed. I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't understand it. But Dr. Jane stuck to his position. And I couldn't confront him. Somebody of his standing and reputation. I was in a quandary. The letters began to mean more than ever. I would get letters from fellow students at Cornell. Or a letter from a former schoolmate at Juilliard. There were many letters from people who were spinal cord injured telling me to fight on. They were a lifeline, those letters. And I would tell Dana, read me another one, take me somewhere. Let me go back in time, let me go back and relive those moments when I could do things. And then there were letters that said, you're going to go through a very morbid, self-pitying stage, but stay with it, you'll come out the other side you'll find that a life is possible. I couldn't believe it, especially after Dr. Zipsky had been there and I'd learned about the new definition of complete. The definition of complete and incomplete had changed at a medical convention in 1992. Until then, if your spinal cord wasn't severed, you were considered incomplete. But since the convention, a spinal cord injury is only considered incomplete if the patient has sensation at the very base of the spine. Dr. Sivsky's parting words had been, we'll do what we can for you. All I had to look forward to was learning how to operate a wheelchair with my mouth and maybe learning how to use a computer with my voice. But slowly I began to come up again I gradually stopped wondering what life do I have and began to consider 
What life can I build? Is there a way to be useful? Maybe to other people in my predicament. Is there a way to be creative again? A way to get back to work? Most of all, is there a way to be there for Dana and Will and Matthew and Alexandra? To be a husband and father again? No answers came, but raising the questions helped. There was one strong image I would cling to when I was alone. Someone, a stranger, had sent me a picture postcard of a Mayan temple in Mexico, the Pyramid of Quetzalcoatl. There were hundreds of steps leading up to the top, and above the temple were blue sky and clouds. I taped this postcard to the bottom of the monitor, where it was always in view. I let it become a metaphor for the future. Even as I would watch all those sobering numbers on the screen, I began to imagine myself climbing those steps one at a time until finally I would reach the top and go into the sky. When Dana said, but you're still you and I love you, it meant more to me than just a personal declaration of faith and commitment. In a sense, it was an affirmation that marriage and family stood at the center of everything, and if both are intact, so is your universe. Many people have known this all their lives. I didn't. Up until the time when I met Dana, from early childhood till I was nearly 40, I didn't believe in marriage, although I'd always yearned for a family. I'd grown up between two families, and neither one ever seemed truly secure. This contributed to my developing fierce independence, which had many positive aspects. But a part of me always looked longingly at other families where there was communication, respect, and unconditional love. I was born on September 25th, 1952, in New York City. My father, the poet and scholar Franklin Dolier Reeve, was a graduate student at Columbia working on a master's degree in Russian. My mother, Barbara Pitney Lamb, had been a student at Vassar. My father was prone to strong passions, whether in politics, ideals, or love. Whatever captured his interest became all-consuming, at least for a time. He courted my mother ardently. They were married in November 1951. She was 19 and Franklin was 23. But there was a widening gulf between my parents when I was born. Franklin was beginning to turn away from his privileged background and to become more involved in his new interests, socialism and Russian language and literature. The atmosphere in our home became increasingly tense. And when the marriage broke up, we went to Princeton because my mother had friends there from the days when she and Franklin were dating. At first, Ben and I visited Franklin on a fairly regular basis, but gradually that tailed off, and especially when my mother married Tristam Johnson, a stockbroker and a Republican, he had a harder time relating to us. After getting his PhD in Russian, my father had applied for a teaching job at Princeton in order to be near us. But friends of my mother who had influence with the president of the university, blocked the appointment, accusing him of being a communist. That turned out to have a lasting impact on our relationship because it meant he couldn't see us as much as he wanted to or to be as involved in our development. In 1956, he married Helen Schmidinger, a fellow graduate student at Columbia, and in February of that year, they had their first child, my half-sister, Alia. Two sons, Brock and Mark, soon followed. I think Franklin realized that Triss would become a more prominent figure in our lives and that he would have far less influence on Ben and me. While the door was still open for visits, he turned his attention to his new wife and family. I remember my father as being both magnetic and unpredictable. Much of the time, Ben and I basked in the glow of his interest and praise. 
He taught us to ski and played tennis with us patiently in the park. But then there would be unexpected moments of remoteness or rejection when it seemed impossible to figure out how to get back in good standing. Once during my freshman year at Cornell, I drove over to his house in Connecticut. He was very distant during that weekend, and I had to spend most of my time talking to my stepmother. And then at one point I abruptly asked him, do you care? Do you care what happens to me? And he said, frankly, Tove, less and less. It was a pretty honest thing to say. It was certainly what I was experiencing, but that's something you never forget. But I still adored my father, and he did have a strong influence on me. I think, for example, that this is one of the reasons that I'm not religious. Franklin had no use for religion. He would make disparaging comments about people coming out of services. He used to call them sheep. And of course, I would instantly agree. He was six foot four, with chiseled features, and because he was so athletic and young, he could play with us like an older brother. He could make life really magical. Even routine activities could be joyful experiences. We used to burn our trash out in the backyard. All five of his children gathered around, tossing egg cartons and papers into the fire, feeling it was a privilege to be with him. When Franklin's sun shone on you, the light was worth everything. Meanwhile, in Princeton, much of my time and energy went into trying to be as perfect as possible. I thought this would set me apart from all the half-brothers and step-brothers who became a part of my life when my mother and father both remarried. I used to hang up all my clothes and always made my bed, trying to do everything right. On the other hand, I took secret risks to see how much I could get away with. One of my favorites, at age 12, was taking the family rambler out for a spin when my mother and stepfather were away. As I grew up, I felt torn between my parents' quite different and opposed worlds. My father's house was filled with books and visiting intellectuals and stimulating conversation. My mother and stepfather's comfortable house often seemed dull by comparison. Tris Johnson had grown up in Princeton and worked for a local investment firm. But my father once explained to me that it was acceptable to be paid wages for a day's work, but to profit from the stock market was morally wrong. Tris had four children of his own and had divorced their mother. He was a very kind man who always wanted the best for us. He thought it would be better for Ben and me to go to the private school of his childhood, Princeton Country Day. I loved it. He would come to watch my soccer and hockey games. I developed a great affection for him. Yet this was complicated by the fact that what I wanted most was my father's approval. Through Tris came a lot of fun things for a kid. Peewee hockey, summers at Bayhead, a little duck boat to learn to sail. By the time I was 12, I'd graduated to Blue Jays and was on the match racing team for the Bayhead Yacht Club. My desire to win turned me into something of a tyrant, however. I could never restrain myself from screaming at my crew out on the race course. After one particularly successful season, I was awarded the coveted Seamanship Sportsmanship Award, which is given to the Outstanding Junior Skipper of the Year. Well, obviously the officers of the club didn't know what really went on in my boat. But the other kids did. I went up to accept the prize at the Labor Day ceremonies and received only a polite smattering of applause. I remember turning beet red and breaking into a sweat as I suddenly realized I didn't deserve this recognition. I never raced a sailboat again. At school, I was one of the few kids who were successful in both academics and sports. 
I was on the honor roll and I could play soccer, baseball, tennis, and hockey. The sports made me popular with the cool kids, whose respect I really sought. But I also wanted to be academically on top, so my father wouldn't be disappointed in me. So I put a lot of pressure on myself. My mother would say later that I was always straining to be older than I was. It was as if I was trying to race through my childhood to get it over with. I generally did everything I was told and then tried to do a little bit extra. My mission was to never give anybody cause for complaint. Then one day in the spring of 1962, when I was nine, somebody came over to PCD from the Princeton Savoyards, an amateur group that put on Gilbert and Sullivan operettas once or twice a year. She asked if any of us could sing and would like to try out for production of The Yeoman of the Guard. I shot up my hand and went for the tryout. I was cast with grown-ups over at McCarter's Theater, the big thousand-seat theater that had been built in the 20s to house productions of the Princeton Triangle Club. I was given the small part of a townsperson. It was my first time on stage and it was intoxicating. This was perfect. It was one thing to be a good student athlete, but acting was even better. Then I started acting PCD. When I was 11 or 12, we put on a production of Agatha Christie's Witness for the Prosecution. And of course, all the parts were played by boys. I was cast as Janet McKenzie the 65-year-old housekeeper in the mansion where the murders take place. On opening night, as I was finishing a heated exchange from the witness box, I got applause from the audience. Right in the middle of the first act, that went straight to my head. Before long, I was cast in small parts with the professional repertory company at McCarter Theater. It felt like a family. Right there was the beginning of a way to escape the conflicting feelings I had about my two families. I'm sure that's why I became an actor. That early success set me up for life. And they began to use me more and more at McCarter, and by my senior year in high school, I was playing some good parts. Franklin himself had a difficult upbringing. Lives repeat themselves in succeeding generations, often in the worst ways, and patterns of behavior can be difficult to break. Like Ben and me, Franklin and his brother Dickie are about a year apart. They also had a difficult relationship with a father who became a distant figure in their lives. I only saw my grandfather, Big Dick Reeve, a couple of times in my life. But in 1985, when he knew he was dying of cancer, he made a trip east from his ranch in Arizona. He went around and touched base with everybody in the family. Franklin probably hadn't seen his father in 35 years, but now there was a reconciliation. They spent time together in Vermont. Franklin told me what a great old man Richard was how much he respected him. It was a complete turnaround. In 1988, my relationship with Franklin broke down completely. I had recently returned from Chile and was working with novelist and playwright Ariel Dorfman on a screenplay based on my experience there, trying to save the lives of 77 actors who had been threatened with execution by the Pinochet regime. I showed Franklin the outline for the film and asked for suggestions, but he strenuously objected to being used in this way and stormed out of the house. Two days later, I received a letter saying he didn't want to see me anymore or have anything to do with me. I was stunned. I thought that sharing my ideas for the film would be received as an invitation for us to become collaborators. I certainly didn't think I was taking advantage of his talent as a writer for my own personal gain. I remember wondering if we were going to play out the same scenario 
as Franklin and his father, I kept trying to put an end to it. I kept trying to break the cycle. And once during the years when we didn't speak, I was on a train that had stopped on a bridge over the Connecticut River. I looked out the window and remembered how we used to circle around in his little sailboat, the Sanderling, waiting for the bridge to open. I wrote him a note recalling those fond memories, but received a letter back accusing me of cheap sentimentality. Much to my surprise, he came to my wedding in 1992, but there were at least 60 people there, and we never found a moment to talk. In August of 94, he watched me compete on my horse, Denver, at a combined training event up in Vermont. We shared a tailgate picnic, and he seemed to enjoy watching our two-year-old Will run around. But nothing really substantial came of our relationship until my accident. Since then, I felt a new reaching out on both sides. He's gone out of his way to visit me and has been constantly in touch. We have had long, satisfying talks in hospital rooms. Out of this disaster has come a new beginning. But in my boyhood and teenage years, Princeton and Tris Johnson and McCarter Theater were my home base, the place where I felt most secure. I had great admiration for Tris, which I felt I had to conceal. There was even a time when I wanted to change my name to Christopher Johnson, to commit to the Johnsons as my real family. It would be Tris, my mother, me, Jeff, Kevin, and Ben, all fitting in as best we could. I thrived on Tris's generosity. He put me through Princeton Day School and Cornell and the drama division at Juilliard. I loved the family dinners. And then sometimes Tris wouldn't come home. The table would be set and he wouldn't show up. He would disappear for a couple of days at a time without any explanation. I had such high hopes that this little family would take hold, particularly when my half-brothers Jeff and Kevin came along. But it didn't work. My mother and Tris were experiencing the beginning of the end. I developed the belief from my childhood that a few isolated moments of contentment or happiness were the best you could hope for in relationships, and they probably wouldn't last. Everything seemed to be built on shifting sand. Even in the theater, a play, a season, was a moment. Inevitably, it would be over and everybody would move on. I developed a tendency to stick to myself and not get too close to anybody. I didn't want to risk too much because I was certain that loss and disappointment would inevitably follow. But I found relief from all this uncertainty in playing characters. I liked knowing the entire storyline, beginning, middle, and end. Both households were troubled. And I remember asking my father why he left my stepmother, Helen, in his mid-fifties. He'd always describe the two of them as so close that we're like one person. We share everything. This is what a family is. And I thought, of course it is. This cozy Victorian farmhouse in Higginham, Connecticut. And Brock, Mark, and all you were such adorable, brilliant children. The makings of a perfect family. When he did separate from Helen in the late 70s, I asked Franklin when he first knew that the marriage wasn't working. And he said, in Paris in 1956, I was stunned. Once again, more shifting sand, more illusions. Looking back now, I still wonder why such wonderful, extraordinary people couldn't build relationships that lasted. I came to believe that marriage was merely a set of obligations undertaken under false pretenses. Even the family that Gay and I created years later with Matthew and Alexandra was not completely genuine because I still couldn't see the point of marriage. When we met, there was a period of intense romance, but I think ultimately we should have been friends rather than lovers. I know that in many ways I was holding back. 
In fact, we were friends, which is why when we separated in 1987, we did it amicably and were able to work things out well between us. We have joint custody of the children and discuss every aspect of their upbringing. Over the past 10 years, there have been no serious disagreements, no rancor or bad feelings. It was exactly the opposite of what happened when my mother and father divorced. But after we separated, I didn't think I had much of a future as far as love and family were concerned. A good marriage seemed more improbable than ever. And then there was Dana. She rescued me when I was lying in Virginia with a broken body, but that was really the second time. The first time she rescued me was the night we met. After my first tries at acting in McCarter, I was accepted at the Williamstown Theater Festival in Massachusetts. I began when I was 15 and ultimately performed there for 14 seasons. Even at the height of my film career, I tried to keep my summers free to rejoin the Williamstown family. There's a cabaret attached to the festival where many of the actors perform at a local inn after the shows. Some of us, myself included, really have no business singing, but admission is cheap and the theater audiences love to hear us perform. It's one of the delights of the Williamstown Theater Festival. But fortunately for the audience, there's a group of four or five real singers known as the Cabaret Corps who hold the evening together. In the summer of 1987, Dana was one of the corps and I was appearing in Afra Bain's The Rover. I'd been separated from Gay for about five months and I'd just finished filming Switching Channels in Chicago and came back to Williamstown determined to be alone and to focus on fixing up the house I'd bought just outside of town. It was set in the middle of 40 acres on a hillside with one of the most spectacular views in the Berkshires. My plan was to have a quiet and reflective summer. I was certainly not looking for a relationship. But I went to the cabaret one night and Dana Morosini stepped out on stage to sing. She wore an off-the-shoulder blue striped dress and sang the music that makes me dance. Oh my God, right then I went down. Hook, line, and sinker. All my friends who were there saw it happen. Afterwards, I went backstage. This was difficult because whenever I'm really attracted to someone, I'm really knocked out, I can be very clumsy. Playing Clark Kent was no stretch for me. Dan and I went slowly because I was concerned about Matthew and Alexandra who were with me for the summer. I didn't want the children who were only seven and three to come into the bedroom and find a strange woman in bed with me. So for most of the summer, Dana and I just dated. When I saw Dana's natural ability and ease with the kids and her sense of fun, I was relieved and thrilled that something that worked for me also worked for them. It all just fell into place. Yet in spite of that joyful summer, I was still carrying all my emotional baggage around with me. Dana shared an apartment in New York City with her sister, and I was over on West 78th Street, but we were really at my place most of the time. We took it step by step while we pursued our separate careers. We both went to Williamstown again the next summer, and this time Dana was hired as an actress. We lived together at my house, when the kids came over, we felt like a little family. By 1990, we were living together on 78th Street, but it was a place that I had shared with Gay and it was difficult for Dana to be there. She felt that we ought to start our own life in our own place, but I wasn't quite ready to do that. I still couldn't get past the issue of marriage. So our relationship nearly went on the rocks in 91 when I was shooting a movie called Morning Glory in Vancouver. I agreed to go into therapy as soon as I got home. During the fall of 91 and most of 92, I finally talked through everything I'd always feared about marriage. And in very short order, I realized I'd be a fool to lose this woman, this relationship. 
And then one night we were having dinner and about halfway through the meal, I just put down my fork and asked her to marry me. We didn't finish dinner. We went straight to the bedroom. I've never been happier, never. And I've never looked back. We were married in Williamstown in April of 92. Although I still think of our real anniversary as June 30th, the night I first saw Dane at the cabaret. I still feel that I met her yesterday. A crisis like my accident doesn't change a marriage. It brings out what's truly there. So when Dana looked at me in the UVA hospital room and said, you're still you, it also meant that we are still us. We are. We made a bargain for life. I got the better part of the deal. On June 28th, I was taken to Kessler to begin the long process of preparing to go home. I had an infection in my lungs and had lost a lot of weight because I couldn't eat. At UVA, a tube had been inserted into my stomach. And although I absorbed 2,000 calories from an IV drip every night, it wasn't enough to keep me from looking gaunt. My body, devastated by the injury, was still very fragile. I learned that I'd never fully recovered from the malaria that I'd contracted in Kenya in 1993. I was given several blood transfusions during the first few weeks, and yet my blood seemed to be disappearing. Dr. Green was concerned because he couldn't understand where it was going. There was a possibility that my bone marrow was not producing red blood cells, and this required a further series of tests. I also needed chest x-rays on an almost daily basis because there was still fluid in both lungs and I was in danger of developing pneumonia. The process of rehabilitation had to be delayed until all these problems could be resolved. I was emotionally fragile as well. Kessler's a first-rate institution, light, open, spread out among lawns and trees, but it's still a place for the ill and bears the inner harshness of all such places. I had a hard time accepting that I was going to spend quite a long time in an institution devoted to the disabled. I couldn't accept myself as one of them. I have great memories of the staff at Kessler. The nurses and aides are really the ones who help you face reality. You may see a professional psychologist once or twice a week but you rely much more on the staff you work with every day. And I had a wonderful Jamaican aide named Juice, whose real name is Glenn Miller. When I gave a speech at the Pierre Hotel my first time out of Kessler, Juice wheeled me onto the stage and I introduced him to the audience. This is my good friend Glenn Miller. He used to be a band leader, but he gave it up to be a physical therapist. We called him Juice because he made fabulous concoctions in a blender. He's a big man, about six feet tall, with strong arms and huge hands. He wears steel rim glasses that he's always losing, and he has the biggest smile I've ever seen. We became very close. Juice is religious, and he believes that I survived for a reason and was in Kessler for a purpose. Every day he came in with such great energy and optimism and so much giving. He, my other aides, Patty and Meredith, my physical therapist, Erica Druin, and my new physiatrist, Dr. Stephen Kirschblum, the director of the spinal cord unit who had replaced Dr. Sipsky as my principal doctor, were the guides who helped me begin to accept my new life. When Dr. Kirschblum took over the responsibility for my care, it was a tremendous psychological boost. I'd had serious problems communicating with Dr. Sipsky and often had a sinking feeling whenever she came into my room. But Dr. Kirschloom and I had an instant rapport. He was funny, irreverent, and deeply committed to his patients. Little by little, I began to emerge from my isolation as I became more comfortable with Kessler. I started to visit the other patients, and soon they came to visit me. 
I found myself talking in depth with people I wouldn't ordinarily have met. Each person had something to offer, and I found myself connecting with many of them in ways that I never would have thought possible. Acceptance of your condition is an essential first step in rehab. Ordinary functions are now completely different. For example, every couple of nights you need to take a shower. Well, this prospect absolutely terrified me. What if something happens to the vent in the shower? What if water gets into the trach or the tube from the ventilator to the opening in my throat? The idea of immersing myself in water petrified me. I'm not sure what my fear actually was, but my condition made me feel open to every imaginable terror. Each step was a huge and horrific adventure, but Juice got me through it. Without him, I wouldn't have been able to face any of these ordeals. And at one point I said to Juice, when I leave here, I wish you'd come work with me. But he said, no, by the time you leave, you're gonna be okay, man. And my job is I gotta help. I gotta help a lot of people. That's his mission. And that's why he's been there for 14 years, earning $8 an hour. It's his service, his giving, his gift. He always pushed me to do a little more. After he helped me work up the courage to go into the shower, he helped me work up the courage to sit in a wheelchair. They brought in a chair very much like the one I have now. It has six areas of command. To go forward or back, left, right, or to go quickly or slowly in this kind of chair, I sip air from a plastic straw or blow into it at various strengths. It took me quite a while to learn how to drive it. I remember one Friday afternoon in the rotunda at Kessler, a large area where I could practice without having to negotiate corners or hallways. And on one side of this practice area, a very pleasant old lady was seated at an upright piano on wheels, playing show tunes for a small group of patients, which was a regular Friday ritual. As she played selections from The King and I, I did 360s and worked on speed control on the other side of the floor. Then I decided to head back to my room, feeling quite confident that I could go in a straight line without much difficulty. But as I passed by the piano, I must have blown a little too hard because suddenly I swerved to the right and as she continued to play Getting to Know You, I hit the piano at full speed and pushed it backwards about five feet. The intrepid pianist didn't even miss a beat. She simply stood up and played on as I apologized profusely and tried to shift my chair into reverse. No one in her audience even raised an eyebrow. Obviously, this was a regular occurrence. I succeeded in backing away and went a little more cautiously down the hallway to the West Wing. After a few weeks, I learned to drive much more responsibly. I'm so accustomed to the chair now, it's like a part of my body. But in the beginning, it too held terrors. Three aides would disconnect my vent from my bed, carry me lying straight out put me in the chair and then reconnect me to the vent on the chair. This meant being disconnected and not breathing for four or five seconds. I didn't realize it at the time, but the purpose of this technique is to introduce the patient to the experience of breathing on his own. I was frightened more than I can say. What if the vent didn't work? My mind would teem with all the possibilities of what could go wrong. Not all of the aides were as patient or compassionate as Juice. They would give me a look that seemed to say, what's his problem? And I felt angry at myself and frustrated because I couldn't control my fear. I'd lie in the bed looking at the chair and I'd think, what is my problem? My first time in the chair, I had a full-blown anxiety attack. I was sitting back and I panicked. I can't be here, I can't do this, get me out. Dana was with me and she said she'd never seen me in such a state, but I was unable to stop it. Sitting back in the chair made me feel confined, 
I saw the straps pinning my arms to the rests, the seat belts, my legs strapped onto the foot pedals. I felt as if I were being put into an electric chair. These episodes of panic were not entirely baseless. I nearly died a week after I arrived at Kessler. I may still have been reacting to the terror of that night. It began with a drug called Sigen, which many people who are spinal cord injured have been taking, although it hasn't been approved by the FDA. To get it, you have to have it flown over from Italy or Switzerland, and it's very expensive. But there's a theory that Sigen helps reduce damage to the spinal cord. There's no conclusive proof, but I was willing to try anything. On the afternoon of July 5th, I received my first injection. At about 6.30 that evening, I began to feel constriction in my lungs. Patty went to get Dr. Kirschblum, Dr. Doug Green, and a few more nurses. Before long, emergency medical teams from two towns had arrived. I was in anaphylactic shock. My lungs had shut down, and I couldn't breathe at all. I was struggling. The doctors were shouting. It was pandemonium. Things seemed more and more surreal as I fought for air. I felt like I was going to drown. Everything around me went gray as Dr. Kirschblum took over. And then I had one of the eeriest experiences of my life. I'd often heard about near death and out of body experiences, but I'd always discounted them. But now something very strange happened to me. I struggled and struggled fighting for air. And then after a while, I just couldn't fight anymore. And I clearly recall thinking, or perhaps even saying aloud, I'm sorry, but I have to go now. I remember those words very specifically. Again, I had that feeling of embarrassment that I had to apologize because I'd failed. I'd fought as hard as I could, but hadn't made it. And then I left my body. I was up on the ceiling. There was no white light, but I looked down and I saw my body stretched out on the bed, not moving while everybody worked on me. The noise and commotion grew quieter as though someone were gradually turning down the sound. A decision was made to give me a massive dose of epinephrine. It jump-started my heart, and suddenly with a jolt I was down from the ceiling and back in my body. I felt my heart racing, my face turning crimson, my whole body pounding as though my pulse were everywhere. Air started to come back and I gulped it in. I was seeing things again from my normal perspective, from within my body. Sounds were incredibly loud and everything was chaotic. The epinephrine had got me going again. I was back. They wheeled me into an ambulance and I spent the next three days in intensive care at the nearest hospital. On the second day, I asked to try the Sigen again. I felt that if this was a drug, it might actually help me, but I was unable to use it. It would be a terrible loss. Nobody had ever had an allergic reaction to Sigen before. I wanted to be sure. So with all the doctors and nurses around me, they introduced the drug again. But when I started to feel the wheezing and the clamping down in my chest, I had to tell them to stop. They gave me a shot of epinephrine right away, and that was my last experiment with Sajin. My confidence was shaken by this episode, and yet I also felt strengthened by it. Once again, I'd survived. I began to believe that I was safe and that I was improving. Whenever he walked into the room, Juice would point out something new that I'd done, something that was better than the day before. And when Dana would arrive, he'd say, here comes your medication, man. Juice took real joy in seeing the healing effect that my family had on me. His lightness of spirit raised ours. Juice often said that he'd like me as an actor, but now I would become a great director. As the summer wore on, sometimes I would sit out on the terrace, 
gazing at clouds for hours at a time. I felt very peaceful. But on other days I couldn't bear to look at those clouds. It was too painful. I wanted to be up there in my sailplane, gliding underneath them the way I used to. One day the clouds would be a wonderful source of serenity, another day a source of bitter resentment. I felt the same way about Kessler. Some days it was a secure, warm, and friendly place of safety, a place where I would get better. Other days it felt like a prison. Fortunately, my down moves didn't last very long. My days at Kessler began at about 7.30, when the morning nurse came in. She would turn off the G-tube, which had been pouring liquid nutrition into my stomach all night. Charlie, the aide, would come in to help. They would range my legs and arms in the bed, pulling and massaging them to maintain flexibility and good circulation. Charlie and Meredith would dress me. When I was ready, I was put into the chair. By 10 o'clock, I was down to physical therapy, being transferred onto a padded table. Erica Juin, my therapist, would very gently put pressure on one side of my head, and I would push against it, moving about an inch. That was it. I tried to move my shoulders a little. I could coax some motion from the trapezius muscles in my right shoulder, but really nothing else. But this small movement was reason for hope, because it took place below the level of my injury. It was something to build on. It was important to persevere, because if you can get a muscle to start moving, sometimes you can get others next to it moving too. I was also taken to a room in the outpatient department, where I sat in my wheelchair in front of a biofeedback machine. Electrodes were placed on my shoulders, and a graph would record my responses on a screen as I moved my trapezius muscles. I could actually see the movement this way. This allowed the therapist to take advantage of my competitive personality to increase my motivation. They would set a target level and throw numbers at me, shouting, you've got to beat that number. Gradually, the numbers began to improve. I couldn't give up because nerves can find new pathways, new ways to stimulate the muscles. I heard about a man who was suddenly able to move his leg three years after his injury. By March of 1996, I could move my scapula muscles just behind the shoulder blades which was a significant improvement. After about an hour with Erica, I'd be taken to occupational therapy, where they would teach me about different kinds of wheelchairs and special computers. From May until December, I ate virtually nothing. I developed an extremely keen sense of smell, a typical consequence of a spinal cord injury, which made even the blandest foods unappetizing. At lunchtime, while most of the other patients went to the cafeteria, I'd go to the lounge and gaze out the window. At two o'clock, it was back to physical therapy. Erica would range me again and try to get my head moving a little bit more. At three, it was back to occupational therapy, and by four, the sessions were over. There were days when I didn't make any progress or even regressed. The worst days were when Bill Carroll, the respiratory therapist, would come in to take a vital capacity, a test to see how much air you can move on your own. The therapist takes a little meter, sticks it on the trach, and closes off the trach collar. Then the hose from the vent is removed, and you try to take in as much air as you possibly can by using your diaphragm, your neck muscles, your shoulder muscles, and by raising your head, in other words, any way you can get it. As you exhale, the meter shows how many cc's of air you've been able to take in using this maximum effort. I couldn't stand it. Back in Virginia, Dr. Jane had predicted that with time I ought to be able to get off the respirator and breathe on my own. But here I was, failing miserably. To even consider weaning yourself off the ventilator, you need a vital capacity of about 750 cc's of air. 
but I could hardly move the needle above zero. Bill did another test called a NIF, negative inspiratory force, that measures the effort your muscles are making as you try to take in air. First you exhale completely, then the trach collar is closed off again, and the therapist measures the effort your muscles make as they attempt to pull in air. But in this test, you don't get a breath. It's strictly a test of muscle strength. Again, I could hardly move the dial. I thought, this is impossible. Whenever I saw Bill Carroll coming around with his instruments, I was filled with dread. Finally, I rebelled out of sheer frustration. At the next team conference, I said, I can't eat, so don't make me eat. I can't do this breathing, so don't make me breathe. I can't do any of it. And they let me off the hook. The philosophy of Kessler is that you are the leader of your own team. Nobody actually makes you do anything. This is not simply capitulation on their part. They're trying to get you to take responsibility for yourself. At about this time, I had to decide if I was well enough to attend the annual fundraising dinner of the Creative Coalition scheduled for the 17th of October. As one of the founders and recent co-presidents, I felt a strong obligation to attend, especially because as far back as January, I'd asked my close friend Robin Williams to be one of the honorees of the evening. The Creative Coalition was founded in 1989 by Ron Silver, Susan Sarandon, and myself, and a number of other celebrities for the purpose of bringing certain issues before the public and trying to affect change. We focus mainly on the National Endowment for the Arts, homelessness, the environment, and campaign finance reform. Robin was to be honored for his appearances on HBO with Billy Crystal and Whoopi Goldberg for Comic Relief, which had raised millions of dollars to help the homeless. After consulting with Dr. Kirschblum and making special arrangements for Patty and Juice to come with me, I told the board of TCC that I'd attend and present Robin with his award. No sooner had I agreed than it dawned on me how challenging this short trip to the Pierre Hotel was going to be. It would be the first time I'd be seen or heard in public. I wondered, would I spasm? My body jerking into an awkward position? Would Juice have time to reposition me in my chair? Would I have a pop-off? Robin put his own security people at our disposal. We rented a van from a local company. Dana dusted off my tuxedo. And on the afternoon of the 17th, I finished therapy early and braced myself to go out into the unknown. I vividly remember the drive into the city. For nearly five months, I'd been cruising the halls of Kessler in my wheelchair at three miles an hour. So driving into the city at 55 was an overwhelming experience. All the other cars seemed so close. Everything was rushing by. And as we hit the bumps and potholes on the way in, my neck froze with tension and my body spasmed uncontrollably while I sat strapped in the back of the van. As we pulled up to the side entrance of the Pierre, Juice and Neil Stutzer, who we'd hired to help us with accessibility, taped sheets over the windows to protect us from the photographers. A special canopy had been constructed that reached from the side door of the Pierre to the roof of our van. Once that was in place, I was lowered down to the ground and quickly pushed into the building. We made our way through the kitchen to the service elevator. And as I went by, the kitchen worker stood against the wall and applauded. I was in something of a daze, but I managed to nod and thank them. Soon I found myself in a suite, and it was time to make all the final adjustments before I was wheeled into the living room to find all my friends and colleagues from TCC, as well as Barbara Walters, Mayor Giuliani, Robin and Marcia, and a sea of other faces all waiting to greet me. Finally, the guests went down to dinner and I was left alone with Dana to recover. We watched the evening's entertainment on a closed circuit TV. 
until it was time for me to prepare to go on stage. I heard Susan Sarandon introducing me, and suddenly Juice was pushing me up the ramp and onto the stage. As I was turned into position, I looked out to see 700 people on their feet cheering. The ovation went on for more than five minutes. I had such mixed feelings of gratitude, excitement, and the desire to disappear. At last, the applause died down, and the audience lapsed into an intense silence. In a moment of panic, I realized I hadn't prepared any remarks. All my attention had been focused on the practicalities of the evening. Luckily, a thought popped into my head, and I went with it. I said, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'll tell you the real reason I'm here tonight. A long pause as I waited for the ventilator to give me another breath. When I was a senior at Princeton Day School, another pause for breath, my English teacher, George Packard, once asked a student, why weren't you here yesterday? And the student replied, well, sir, I wasn't feeling very well. And George Packard replied, the only excuse for non-attendance is quadruple amputation. I could feel the audience holding its breath. In which case, they can still bring you in in a basket. So I thought I'd better show up. A huge laugh and applause. I'd made it. The rest was easy. I introduced Juice as Glenn Miller, talked about how I'd missed everyone at TCC, talked about Robin and his accomplishments, and then brought him up on stage. For the next 20 minutes, he and I bounced off each other. He took the curse off the wheelchair, going around behind it and pretending to adjust all the controls. He told the audience I had to be careful with the sip and puff control, because if I blew too hard into the tube, I might pop a wheelie and blast off into the audience. The evening was transformed into a celebration of friendship and endurance. Later, as we bounced along over the potholes and through the Lincoln Tunnel back to New Jersey, I hardly noticed the rough ride. Dana, Juice, Patty, and I were practically babbling with excitement about the evening. Dana had commandeered a nice bottle of Chardonnay from the suite of the Pierre, and we drank a toast to this milestone in my rehabilitation. Soon I realized I'd have to leave Kessler, but I thought, God, I've totally given up on breathing. What am I going to do, stay in a ventilator for the rest of my life? My diaphragm had been doing nothing since May. Now it was the end of October. I was aware that if I allowed it to atrophy, I might never be able to use it. I decided I had to make another attempt to breathe on my own. I announced that on the first Monday of November, I was going to try again to breathe on my own. On November 2nd, Bill Carroll, Dr. Kirschbloom, Dr. Finley from Kessler's research department, and Erica met me in the PT room at 3.30 in the afternoon. And I remember thinking, this is it. I've got to do something. I have simply got to. I don't know where it's going to come from, but I've got to produce some air from someplace. Dr. Finley said, we're going to take you off the ventilator, and I want you to try to take 10 breaths. If you can only do three, then that's the way it is. But I want you to try for 10. And I took 10 breaths. I was lying on my back. My head moved up as I struggled to draw in air. I wasn't able to move my diaphragm at all, just my chest, neck, and shoulder muscles in an intense effort to bring some air into my lungs. I was only able to draw an average of 50 cc's with each attempt, but at least I'd moved the dial. We came back the next day, and now I was really motivated. My average was 450 cc's. They couldn't believe it, and I thought to myself, all right, now we're getting somewhere. At 3.30 the next day, I was in place and ready to begin, but several members of our team were late. 
And I thought, come on, we gotta have some discipline here. We've all gotta get together if we're gonna make this happen. Finally, I was really taking charge. This time the average was 560 cc's for breath. A cheer broke out in the room. And the next day, I breathed on my own for seven and a half minutes. Bill Carroll was beside himself. I've never seen progress like that. You're gonna wean, you're gonna get off this thing. For the first time, I thought it might be possible. After that, Eric and I worked alone. And just before I left Kessler, I gave it everything I had, and I breathed for 30 minutes. And I remember Dr. Kirschblum saying, I don't know how you're doing this, but then I don't know how you do a lot of what you do. The previous summer, still adjusting to my new circumstances, I'd given up. But by November, I had the motivation to go forward. And something else happened to me during those months, which was as therapeutic as any physical progress. When I first came to Kessler, I'd wanted no part of the disabled population, but gradually I'd come to see that not only was I part of it, but that I might be able to do something important for all of us. I began to think that I could be useful to the scientists who were searching for a cure for paralysis. Although I'd made several serious movies, such as The Remains of the Day, it was clearly my portrayal of Superman that the public had taken to. I knew this role had a unique resonance and had won a great deal of public affection for me, for which I'd always been grateful. And it seemed that my injury, if anything, had created a new level of public support. I was visited in Kessler by Dr. Wise Young of New York University Medical Center and by Arthur Ulian, who had been paralyzed from the waist down in a bicycle accident. Wise Young is one of the great pioneers of spinal cord research. Arthur Ulian has been lobbying Congress for years. And at about the same time, I was contacted by Henry Stifel, chairman of the American Paralysis Association asking if I might find a celebrity host for their annual fundraising dinner that November. I was able to enlist Paul Newman, and with his participation, the dinner was a tremendous success. Juice thought that my injury had meaning, and had a purpose. I believed, and still do, that my injury was simply an accident. But maybe Juice and I are both right because I have the opportunity now to make sense of this accident. I believe it's what you do after a disaster that can give it meaning. I began to face my new life. On Thanksgiving in 1995, I went home to Bedford to spend the day with my family. In the driveway when I saw our home again, I wept. Dana held me. And at the dinner table, when each of us in turn spoke a few words about what we were thankful for, Will said, Dad. My original discharge date from Kessler was during the second week of November, but Dr. Gerswum had convinced my insurance company to let me stay another month in response to my initiative about breathing. Getting permission to stay longer in rehab was a major victory in our ongoing battles about insurance. During most of my stay at Kessler, Dr. Kirschbloom, Dana, and I had to spend a tremendous amount of time writing passionate letters, fighting for reimbursement for medical necessities. The first major struggle was over nursing hours, and then they refused to pay for a backup ventilator. But what angered me most it was their refusal to pay for any exercise equipment. Countless researchers have emphasized the importance of preparing the body for new treatments and therapies. If the muscles are allowed to atrophy, or if there's a significant loss of bone density due to inactivity, if the diaphragm isn't exercised, then the patient will not be able to benefit from the progress the scientists are making. In my case, the company would not pay for any physical therapy work below the shoulders. 
But because I believe so strongly that a cure for paralysis is possible, I equipped our home with essential exercise equipment. Some bought and some donated. Electrologic of America provided me with a bicycle, which allows me to maintain the strength and mass of my leg muscles. Electrical stimulation causes contractions in the muscles, which drive the pedals of the bike. Within a few weeks, I could cycle for half an hour without stopping. The benefit of this bike should be available to anyone with a spinal cord injury. Unfortunately, the retail cost is $100,000. I also have a Stim Master, which cost me $30,000, and special pants with electrodes attached that work all the leg muscles. Thanks to this machine, made by Bioflex, a small company in Ohio. The dimensions of my thighs and calves are almost the same as before the injury. And at least twice a week, I try to find time for the tilt table. Retail cost $15,000, which allows me to stand with my legs and feet supporting my full body weight. One of the reasons that insurance companies deny essential equipment and care is because only 30% of patients and their families fight back. Well, this allows the insurers to save enormous amounts of money. They would save even more by providing patients with the things they need. In most cases, the patient would improve dramatically or even be cured and no longer require costly reimbursements. In addition to wanting to work on my breathing, I still felt I needed more time at Kessler to prepare for the transition to life at home. I'd gone home for a one-day visit at Thanksgiving, and it had been very stressful and depressing. Although I tried to cover up my feelings as best I could, I spent much of the day parked by the fireplace. Ordinarily, I would have been hosting the gathering, carving the turkey, and organizing a pickup soccer game out in our front yard. My appetite was just starting to come back, and I struggled to be cheerful as Dana fed me a tiny portion of turkey and mashed potatoes. We tried our best, but everyone knew that this Thanksgiving was painfully different. Dana and I made arrangements with the owners of Caremore, a home care nursing agency. I would need 24-hour a day nursing, plus a staff of aides to help lift me in and out of bed and do work around the house that I would have ordinarily done myself. I'd also come to terms with the fact that because of a pop-off or a sudden vent failure, even in my own house, I'd never be able to be alone again. I'd always cherished my independence, and time alone was very important to me. One of my greatest pleasures had been sailing long distances by myself. I had many conversations with Dr. Kirschblum, I admitted to him that one of my fears about leaving the sanctuary of Kessler was that I would have to resume being a public figure. Steve Kirsten very kindly advised me that I had no obligations to be the poster boy for spinal cord injury. I appreciated this, but I felt I needed to do something not just for myself, but for everyone else in the same condition. I'd met and spoken with the scientists who were working on the problem of nerve regeneration. I understood that there had recently been several exciting discoveries, but that without public interest and enthusiasm, without an influx of money, progress would be difficult, if not impossible. One of the reasons that the search for a cure for paralysis had never captured the public interest is that it had always been considered incurable. And sadly, few victims of a spinal cord injury survived long enough to attract much attention. Most died of the inevitable pneumonia that sets in within days of the initial trauma. For a long period, it was assumed that the damaged nerves were simply incapable of regrowth. And then in 1988, there was a major finding. Dr. Martin Schwab, working on nerve regeneration at the University of Zurich, discovered two proteins that inhibit growth in a mammal's damaged spinal cord. Two years later, Schwab was able to induce nerve regeneration in the spinal cord of a rat by blocking the inhibiting proteins with an antibody. 
In addition, he surprised scientists all over the world by demonstrating that his nerves regenerate. They seem to have some kind of sense memory of where to go. Researchers had always feared that even if regeneration is possible, the new nerves might simply wander aimlessly or make inappropriate reconnections. You might end up thinking, move my left toe, but your right elbow would move instead. But Schwab achieved regeneration of about three to four millimeters in his rats in an absolutely straight line. My first step forward into raising public awareness and money for research had been asking Paul Newman to host the APA dinner. The event brought in close to a million dollars and previous benefits had raised only about 300,000. I was asked to give a speech that night. When I had the audience's attention, I began by saying, I want to tell you about the wall of my room at Kessler. A fascinating subject, don't you think? But on it, there was a poster, a picture of the space shuttle blasting off at night, signed and sent to me by all the NASA astronauts currently in training. Written across the top was, We found anything is possible. I reminded the audience that in 1961, President Kennedy had issued the challenge to land a man on the moon before the end of the decade. At the time, scientists thought that goal was impossible. And yet the vision was so captivating that it became a reality. It took the combined efforts of 400,000 workers at NASA and dozens of companies, but in July of 1969, Neil Armstrong took that giant step for mankind. I suggested that it was time to propose a similar challenge to medical science. This time the mission would be the conquest of inner space, the brain and the central nervous system. I had no doubt that an all-out attack would produce dramatic results. And to create a sense of urgency, to give the quest a human face, I declared my intention to walk by my 50th birthday only seven years away. I would have to back up to speech with action. From my work with the Creative Coalition, I had access to Washington and friends like Senators Paul Simon, Jim Jeffers, Patrick Leahy, and John Kerry, who could help guide me. I even had a working relationship with President Clinton, having campaigned for him in 1992. I also knew it was important to reach out to the other side of the aisle, because any real progress would have to come from a bipartisan effort. Everyone at APA was delighted with the evening, and a few weeks later I was elected chairman of the board. Today, with scientists convinced that nerve regeneration is imminent, I've learned that the research now centers on three approaches. Preserving the intact nerves, restoring function in the surviving ones, as well as the most exciting possibility, the regeneration of nerves in the spinal cord. In 1995, Barbara Walters interviewed Wise Young as part of a profile on me, and she asked him point blank if I'd ever walk again. Wise replied that at first there's hope, but over time, hope ebbs. Two years later, when he was interviewed for 48 hours, he said that with adequate funding, it might be possible for me to walk within five to seven years. At a fundraising dinner in Puerto Rico in May of 97, I showed footage of rats that had been treated with a drug in Wise's laboratory after a complete transection of the spinal cord. One month later, the hind legs had regained function in fact, one rat was trying to climb out of the basin he was kept in. When the lights came up, I turned to the audience and said, Oh, to be a rat. With my involvement in research and fundraising, my life became busier than it had been before the accident. I made speeches all over the country, hosted fundraisers, and lobbied in Washington. I was gratified by the last line in a Newsweek article on me. The writer concluded, we should all be so disabled. As I began to study the problem of how to raise more money for research, 
I realized we would have to tap the resources of the government, as well as private donors. I had met a number of times with the director of the NIH, Dr. Harold Varmus. He explained that $8.7 billion is spent annually merely to maintain spinal cord patients. The economics of the situation make little sense. I once heard a scientist exclaim, Give us a hundred million dollars and we can cure Parkinson's. If the budget of the NIH were doubled, raised from 13 to 26 billion, the pace of research would be greatly accelerated and therapies would come much more quickly. By some estimates, the government would soon save as much as 300 billion dollars. In the near future, there'll be a vaccine for diabetes. New drugs can arrest the nerve degeneration in MS patients. An AIDS vaccine may soon be possible because of the money spent on research. I became so involved in talking to scientists and plotting strategies to increase funding for research that I began to neglect my own rehabilitation. Nevertheless, by January of 97, I was able to breathe off the vent for up to 90 minutes and fundraising momentum was building. Shortly after returning to Bedford, I was contacted by Joan Irvine Smith, a horsewoman and a great philanthropist. She was touched by the fact that I hadn't blamed my horse for the accident. She told me she was moved by my situation and wouldn't rest until I walked. She decided to create a chair in my name at UC Irvine dedicated to finding a cure for chronic spinal cord injury. She put up a million dollars of her own money, an amount that was matched by the state. Additional funds have been coming in from the private sector, and the goal is five million dollars. Joan Irvine Smith also created an incentive for research, a $50,000 prize given annually to the scientist who's done the most to further spinal cord research in the preceding year. In the fall of 96, I presented the first award to Martin Schwab. He showed me what he'd been doing, work that hadn't even been published yet. He'd been able to take a rat who'd been injured for two months and get nerve fibers to regenerate two centimeters. That's a long distance. With my injury at C2, you would only need to regenerate 20 millimeters to obtain functional recovery. First breathing, then arm movements, control of my hands, and so on down the line. And if the regenerated nerve successfully grew to the lumbar area, I would get up and walk. The last thing Dr. Schwab said to me as I was leaving is that by the end of 1998, we ought to be able to do things at the clinical level which had been thought impossible only a few years ago. But when I left Kessler in December of 95, much of this work had not yet been accomplished. Wise Young's words to Barbara Walters still haunted me, that over time, hope ebbs. And I remember talking to Dr. Kirschman late one night and saying that I didn't want to join the ranks of spinal cord victims who had given up. For my own emotional well-being, I had to banish negativity from my mind. Lindbergh made it across the Atlantic. Houdini got out of those straitjackets. With enough money and grassroots support, why shouldn't I be able to get out of this wheelchair? When you're trapped in a dark room, you think, where's the exit? And you find the exit by remaining calm and slowly feeling your way in the dark until you find the door. By the beginning of 98, it seemed more certain than ever that victims of brain and central nervous system disorders would be able to escape from that dark room. The first fetal cell transplants into a human spinal cord were accomplished by researchers in Gainesville, Florida. Martin Schwab, having succeeded in developing the antibody to the protein inhibitors in rats, moved into primates with similar success. After studying my latest MRI, Taken at UC Irvine in September of 97, he wrote to say that I'd be a prime candidate for the first human trials, which were scheduled to begin within a year. Articles about spinal cord research began to appear on the front pages 
of the leading newspapers around the country. Then on January 3rd, 1998, the New York Times carried a headline that many thought would never have appeared. Government set to increase medical research spending. And on the second page of the article it said, Congress appears eager to invest in a cause popular among voters, beginning with a $900 million increase in the 1998 budget. The Clinton administration proposed to increase funding for the NIH by $1 billion per year over the next five years. Momentum was gathering in Congress to go further, to double the NIH budget within that period of time. Members were beginning to recognize the economic advantages as well as the popularity of the issue in an election year. And I was particularly gratified by a comment that the president made in the Times article. He said that this entry had been devoted to discoveries and achievements in the world around us, including the conquest of outer space. In the next century, we should focus on solving the mysteries and conquering the difficulties of the world within us. If the President and Congress follows through with the vision made public at the beginning of this new year, it'll be a major victory for all the advocates of research who've worked so long and so hard to make this happen. I felt that part of the speech I gave at the Democratic Convention had been validated. At first, something seems impossible, then it becomes improbable, but with enough conviction and support, it finally becomes inevitable. Sometimes in the winter of 1970 to 71, I would look out the windows of the Cornell University Library and wonder what I was doing there. After graduating from Princeton Day School in June of 1970, I had planned to go to New York and join the ranks of young hopefuls trying for a career in the theater. But my mother, who had dropped out of college to get married, always regretted that she hadn't finished college she convinced me that four years of study and personal growth would only help me later on. In retrospect, the time I spent at Cornell was absolutely invaluable. The theater department under the direction of John Clancy was first rate. My newfound patience had been put to the test, however, in the fall of my freshman year, when I found a letter addressed to me from Star Kesseltein, one of the most respected agents in New York. He had seen my performance in a month in the country and wanted to represent me. Would it be convenient for me to meet him in New York at some time in the near future? I was tremendously flattered and excited. I called Stark, thanked him for the note, and mentioned that I would be free on Monday. When I was ushered into his office, he said, When are you available? I explained the agreement with my parents that I would finish college and was amazed when he said they had made a wise decision. We decided we would concentrate on finding work for the summer vacations. I ended up in the touring cast of 40 Carats, starring Eleanor Parker. The following summer, I was offered a full season contract with the San Diego Shakespeare Festival with decent parts in Richard III, the Merry Wives of Windsor and Love's Labor's Lost, on the main stage at the Old Globe Theater. The season of the Globe was so enlightening that I wanted to see more top professional actors at work in both modern and classical plays. So with money saved for my job at the Globe, I took a three-month leave of absence from Cornell, packed an knapsack, and headed for England. When I returned to Cornell in January of 73, I found it hard to concentrate. I wanted to train for the theater, and courses at a liberal arts university seemed insufficient. Jack O'Brien, who'd hired me for the Shakespeare season in San Diego, was now on the faculty of the Juilliard School in New York. I had a long talk with John Clancy, and we agreed that my first year at Juilliard would also count as my senior year at Cornell. I was ecstatic. I'd be able to keep my agreement with my parents while making greater progress in my chosen career. But now the problem was how to get into Juilliard. Jack O'Brien recommended me to the legendary John Hausman, the director of the drama division. 
Still, my audition was more nerve-wracking than any arranged by Star Kesseltine. Hausman was the man who'd co-founded the Mercury Theater with Orson Welles and had just won an Academy Award for his role in The Paper Chase. Each prospective student had to present two pieces, one classical and one modern. If Hausman was unimpressed, he would boom out a resounding, Thank you, from the darkness, and the aspiring young actor would have to apply elsewhere. When I finished, Jack O'Brien was beaming. Hausman said nothing. But Marion Seldes, one of the most supportive acting teachers a student could ever hope for, called out, Thank you. That was lovely. Three weeks later, the official letter came from Hausman himself. One other actor and I had been accepted into the advanced program. Classes would begin September 15th. The first person I met at Juilliard was the other advanced student, a short, stocky, long-haired fellow who wore tie-dyed shirts with tracksuits and talked a mile a minute. I'd never seen so much energy contained in one person. He virtually bounced off the walls. To say that he was on would be a major understatement. There was never a moment when he wasn't doing voices, imitating teachers, making our faces ache from laughing at his antics. His name, of course, was Robin Williams. My first role at Juilliard was Dr. Johnny in Summer and Smoke by Tennessee Williams. Dr. Johnny's relationship with his father is a key issue, and I identified strongly with him. I was able to draw on certain truths in my own life, and my performance went well. Afterwards, I was called into Hausman's office for a private critique, which was standard operating procedure but Hausman was still a daunting figure to most of us. He closed the door, settled into his rocking chair, and after a long pause, he intoned, Mr. Reeve, it is terribly important that you become a serious classical actor. Unless, of course, they offer you a shitload of money to do something else. <laughs> I love John Hausman from that moment on. I was enjoying the school atmosphere and working with my classmates, among them Mandy Patinkin, Bill Hurt, Diane Venora, and, of course, the amazing Mr. Williams. And I'd planned to return to Juilliard, but Tris was having a hard time financially. I learned from my mother that it would have been a hardship for him to continue to put me through school. Before the summer, I'd auditioned for a soap opera called Love of Life. I was offered the part of Ben Harper, a charismatic bad boy. I spoke to Hausman, trying to work out an arrangement which would allow me to do the soap opera and finish my second year at Juilliard at the same time. Hausman reluctantly agreed because he understood that it was a financial necessity. I started working at CVS in late July of 74. Soon the ratings began to go up and the brass attributed it to Ben Harper. Ben was the tennis pro at the local country club, but this was only a cover. He arranged kickbacks for the mayor's office, had a scheme to extort a half a million dollars from his mother, and was married to two women at the same time. The role of Ben Harper marked the end of my anonymity, because soap opera stars have huge followings. People get very involved in the soaps. In fact, in late August, I was driving down Route 93 in New Hampshire and pulled into a service station to have an ice cream cone. And I was sitting on the hood of my car when suddenly a woman came over, took a vicious swipe at me with her handbag, and screamed, How dare you treat your mother that way? There was no opening line, no, uh, I've seen your show, just whap. Well, I decided to take it as a compliment. As the ratings went up, the producers began to write more scenes for Ben and his two wives. Finally, the soap opera schedule forced me to drop out of Juilliard. This gave me enough time to try out for plays around town, off and off-off Broadway. At the theater for the New City, we did a play by Jacques Levy called Bertus Cotton, 
about the goings-on at Hitler's summer retreat. I played a young elite guard in the compound. The play was superbly directed by Ilya Kazan's wife, Barbara Loden. She asked me to play the character calmly and rationally. She said, you look like a Nazi, so when you come out and talk about opportunity and pride and speak warmly and simply to the audience, it'll be all the more chilling. Her advice helped me in many different parts over the years. Remembering what she told me, I underplayed Superman. I was six foot four, strong and physically imposing. So I played against that, trying to make him as casual as possible, letting the audience sense an implied power. Contradictions are always more interesting to an audience than playing the part on the nose. Barbara was really my first coach, and she helped me steer around cliches. When she died of cancer at a young age, I was devastated. In the fall of 1975, I had the opportunity to audition for A Matter of Gravity, a new play by Enid Bagnold starring Katherine Hepburn. The second lead was the part of her grandson, Every white male actor between 25 and 35 wanted to try out for it. Much to her credit, Miss Hepburn heard nearly 200 of them. I was extremely nervous, but as I was walking out, that famous voice called to me from the dark. Rehearsals begin September 17th. My agent, Stark, was blown away. But now I faced a huge logistical problem. I was cast in a matter of gravity in September of 75, but my contract with Love of Life ran until July of 76. How would I be able to play in the Hepburn production in tryout cities from Toronto to Washington and still hop from bedroom to bedroom as Ben Harper? By begging. I went first to our producers and then all the way up the line to Daryl Hickman, the head of daytime drama at CBS. The CBS brass, however, were unmoved. I explained my problem to Miss Hepburn, and she went straight to the phone, called Daryl Hickman, and dismantled him into small pieces. By the end of the day, I had two jobs. I adored her, but she scared the pants off me most of the time. On a good day, though, I could stand up to her, which I think she respected. I believe I was fairly close to what a child or grandchild might have been to her. A gossip column in the Boston papers even suggested we were having an affair. She was 67, I was 22, but I thought that was quite an honor. The play had been a tremendous learning experience, but in the summer of 76, when the production moved to Los Angeles, I dropped out. She was very disappointed in me for doing that. We'd created a special relationship, and then I hadn't stayed the course. But I was enticed by movies at this point. The play was really her vehicle, a chance for the audience to see Katherine Hepburn live. While the rest of us were not exactly set dressing, we weren't absolutely essential to the proceedings. I felt I needed to move on. Stark convinced me to go to Los Angeles, where I was offered a small part in the film Grey Lady Down with Charlton Heston and Stacy Keach about the efforts to rescue the crew of a sunken nuclear submarine. I played a young lieutenant aboard the rescue ship and always stood as close as possible to Stacy Keach in order to have more time on screen. But by October, I'd headed back to New York in this theater. I called my friend Bill Hurt and asked if he knew of anything interesting that was casting. He said that he'd just been offered the lead in my life at the Circle Repertory Company, and the small but important role of the grandfather was still open. He arranged for me to audition, and two weeks later we started rehearsals. In late January, Star called to say that I had been asked to audition for the lead in a big movie for a major studio. The casting director, Lynn Stallmaster, had pleaded with the director for a meeting. Three times he put my picture and resume on the in pile, and each time the producers put it back on the out pile. But finally, he persuaded them to bring me in for a meeting. 
I agreed to go because Stark had always said, audition for everything and then make your choices afterwards. So at three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon in January of 1977, I rang the doorbell of a plush suite at the Sherry Netherland and was ushered in to meet Elias Salkind and Richard Donner, the producer and director of Superman. Today I spend much of my time traveling around the country, giving speeches, visiting rehab centers, and lobbying in Washington for more money for biomedical research. In 1996, I was approached by Senator Jeffords of Vermont about an amendment to a bill in the Senate which would raise lifetime insurance caps from $1 million to $10 million. Most people don't realize that their insurance policies expire after the million dollar limit has been reached. Under normal circumstances, you'd never expect that to happen. But in a family with a hemophiliac child or a catastrophic illness or injury, that amount may only last a few years. So I wrote a letter to every senator explaining that the increased insurance caps would not be a hardship on employers. The cost, approximately $9 a year per worker in a medium-sized company, could be split between management and the employees. Businesses employing less than 20 people would be exempt, and the legislation would not go into effect until 2004. I spent over a month on this issue, giving interviews and making follow-up calls, trying to keep the amendment alive. When the roll call was taken, the tally was 42 votes in favor of it. Even though we lost, the margin was much smaller than expected. In February of 96, the producer Quincy Jones asked me to make a special appearance on the Academy Awards at the end of March. I was extremely grateful for this invitation because it was a gesture of inclusion by the film industry. I would speak briefly about socially relevant films and urge the Hollywood community to remember how influential and necessary such work can be. Every possible consideration, hotel room, security, vans, a private jet, was extended to me and Dana and our large staff of nurses and aides in order to facilitate the trip. And while I was rolling into position on stage at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, I felt that I was in the zone. My name was announced, a curtain went up, and I was revealed center stage in my chair. I looked out at a sea of friendly faces. Everyone was standing and reaching out to me. I truly felt embraced by the audience. The appearance on the Oscars gave me the courage to accept the many public engagements, both live and on film, which have now become such an important part of my life. But another completely unexpected benefit came out of the Oscar adventure. During my stay in Hollywood, I entered hotels and buildings through garages, kitchens, and service elevators, and I met cooks, waiters, chambermaids, and maintenance crews along the way. Many of them said they were praying for me. Others looked me right in the eye and said, We love you, Superman. You're our hero. At first, I couldn't believe that they met it. And then I realized the fact that I was in a wheelchair, unable to move below my shoulders, and dependent on the support of others for almost every aspect of my daily life, had not diminished the fact that I was, and always would be, their Superman. Filming Superman was often tedious and exasperating. I spent months hanging on wires for brief moments in the movie that would often have to be reshot. But ultimately, it was a wonderful experience. One of my favorite memories is of running into Sir John Gielgud in a hallway at Pinewood Studios in London. We'd met before at a social occasion, and now I was dressed in full Superman regalia. And as he shook my hand, he said, So delightful to see you. What are you doing now? I approached the role seriously. I always flatly refused any invitation to mock the Superman character or send him up. 
With the success of Superman came innumerable invitations for public service as the character. Through the Make-A-Wish Foundation, I visited terminally ill children whose last request was to meet Superman. I joined the board of directors of Save the Children, and in 1979, I served as a track and field coach at the Special Olympics in Brockport, New York. One of the other coaches was a charismatic football star named O.J. Simpson. After the success of Superman, one of my greatest problems as an actor was that my agents and many Hollywood producers wanted me to be an action hero. I made it clear to everyone who worked with me that I wanted to play parts that were complex and challenging. Over the next few years, Superman actually opened many doors. My first role after Superman turned out to be a delicate romantic fantasy called Summer in Time with Jane Seymour. We began filming in late May of 79 at the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island on Lake Michigan. When the film opened in October, Vincent Canby in the New York Times wrote, this film does for screen romance what the Hindenburg did for dirigibles. And Christopher Reeve looks like a helium-filled canary. One more roll like this and it's back to the Cape forever. Audiences stayed away in droves and the film disappeared within a few weeks. Needless to say, this was a huge blow. I'd never failed so visibly before. Over the years, however, a miraculous transformation took place. Cable television spread across the country, and people began to discover our little movie. Die-hard fan of the film, Bill Shepard of Covina, California, founded Insight, the international network of summer and time enthusiasts. Every October, the Grand Hotel hosts nearly 700 members who come for a special summer and time weekend. Dane and I attended the gathering in the fall of 94 and enjoyed an overwhelming reception. Thanks to persistent pressure from Insight members, the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce gave me a star on the Walk of Fame, 17 years after the film's debut. When the filming of Summer in Time was completed in August of 1979, I immediately returned to London to begin filming Superman 2. Gay and I bought a house in Chelsea, but the real highlight of 1979, in fact the highlight of my entire life up to that point, was the birth of my son Matthew on December 20th. In the fall we moved to New York because I'd been asked to do Lanford Wilson's Fifth of July on Broadway. The play had originated at Circle Rep where Bill Hurd had distinguished himself as Ken Talley, a former school teacher and Vietnam vet who is now a bilateral amputee. Fifth of July received outstanding reviews. I was happy because I felt it confirmed that I could play complex characters, play against type, and be successful. My next role was even further away from the conventional leading man than Ken Talley. I played a psychopathic student opposite Michael Caine in Sidney Lumet's film of Death Trap. Death Trap prepared the way for James Ivory's film of the Bostonians. I was offered the lead of Basil Ransom, an impoverished writer from Mississippi who comes to New York in the 1870s. I was thrilled by the offer. My agents were not. Ispile Merchant could only afford to pay me $100,000 less than a tenth of my established price at the time. But I cheerfully ignored my agent's advice and went to work on my Mississippi accent. The Bostonian succeeded beyond everyone's expectations. One of the most enjoyable aspects of filmmaking for me was the opportunity to go on location all over the world. I also enjoyed keeping up with my various sports interests during production. While we made the Bostonians, I lived aboard my sailboat. During the shooting of Superman 3, I would make my way down to Red Hill in Surrey, the home of the Tiger Club. The club was a group of aviators, many of whom had served in the Royal Air Force and flown in the Battle of Britain. The Tiger referred to the Tiger Moth, a vintage World War I combat plane 
Several of them were still maintained by the club, as well as other open cockpit planes like the Stearman. I was thrilled when I showed the club president my American license and was then invited to join as an overseas member. But it was a complete coincidence when I received a script called The Aviator about an airmail pilot in the 1920s on the route between Nevada and Idaho. The mail was carried in the front compartment of a steerman. The producers had no idea that I could actually fly a steerman, but agreed to me that if I did my own piloting, we would have opportunities to make the film more realistic than if we'd had to use a double. We filmed on the border of the former Yugoslavia and Austria. My favorite days involved flying, acting, and a little directing as well. And one afternoon I landed and was given the message that my daughter Alexandra had just been born in London. Anyone looking at a picture of me and Gay and these two beautiful little children would have thought it a Christmas card portrait of a perfect young family. But I still had not overcome my feelings about marriage. Even though Gay and I made a genuine, valiant effort to build the bond between us, I still felt unsettled and restless. I was in turmoil. Elated over the birth of Alexandra, but confused and anxious about the direction my life was taking. Throughout the 1980s, I kept the commitment I'd made to avoid action pictures in favor of smaller films with more complex roles. Whenever I couldn't find a good film project, I went back on the stage. In 1984, I appeared with Vanessa Redgrave and Dame Wendy Hiller in the Aspirin Papers in London's West End. In the summer of 1985, I had a great time chewing up the scenery as Tony in the royal family at Williamstown, and then played the Count in The Marriage of Figaro at the Circle in the Square in New York. In early 86, still trying to find a decent film project, I was looking through my bookshelves and I came across a script called Street Smart. It had been sitting there for years. Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus, the owners of Canon Films, produced and financed Street Smart on the condition that I play Superman in at least one more sequel. As we were filming in Montreal, writers Larry Connor and Mark Rosenthal were busy churning out the script for Superman 4. The premise this time, based largely on input from me, I'm sorry to say, was that Superman would intervene in the nuclear arms race. Big mistake. Often my work provided a welcome distraction from the complexities of my private life, but not this time. Not only was the film a mess, but my relationship with Gay was deteriorating. In spite of the tremendous sorrow I felt about leaving the children behind, Gay and I could no longer keep up appearances. And when the production ended in February of 87, I moved back to New York. One of the clear indications that I was deeply depressed was that I lost the willpower to make my own decisions. I'd switched agents in the fall of 85 because I wasn't getting the roles I wanted. The first project my new agents at ICM had put together for me was the Street Smart Superman 4 deal which turned out to be a disaster. Golan and Globus had spent no money on advertising and promoting Street Smart, so it quickly vanished despite excellent reviews. Superman 4 was simply a catastrophe from start to finish, and that failure was a huge blow to my career. Now I let my team of agents talk me into switching channels, yet another remake of the front page. At the preview that fall, I could tell by the audience response that switching channels would go down the drain. Coming so soon after the debacle of Superman 4, it marked the end of my nine-year run as an above-the-line movie star. And then, on the evening of June 30th, I went to the cabaret and saw Dana. Since the accident, I've had time to look back. Much more time than I would have liked. It seems that I succeeded very quickly, perhaps too quickly in my career, while my personal life was relegated to the background. By the late 80s and early 90s, 
One door had slammed shut in my face. I was no longer an A-list actor. Now my agents had to fight for meetings. And sometimes I had to audition, which had not been necessary for over a decade. But I was always able to find some kind of work. Sometimes I did a TV movie of the week to pay the bills. But some projects, like the film Morning Glory and The Rose and the Jackal and The Sea Wolf, both made for TNT, were some of my best work. And where one door had closed, another had opened. My relationship with Dana was blossoming. My personal life became more satisfying than ever. Now, when I went on location, my contract always included a house big enough for all of us. Dana, myself, Will, the nanny, and Matthew and Al when they came to visit. In October of 1992, there was a brief period when my professional and personal life seemed perfectly balanced. I was reunited with the Merchant Ivory Group for the first time since the Bostonians. I was co-starring with Anthony Hopkins and Emma Thompson. And the script is one of the best I'd ever read. Dana, Will, and I were together and Matthew and Al made frequent trips by train from London to be with us. When the remains of the day premiered in the fall of 93, it was hailed as a masterpiece and received eight Oscar nominations. But when the articles and reviews came out, I was scarcely mentioned. I'd had the satisfaction of being part of an undeniably great film, but it did nothing for my career. And I was fortunate in having other passionate interests that helped sustain me during the reversals in my career. In the late 80s, I began to take riding more seriously. Dane and I built our boat, the Sea Angel, and roamed from the Chesapeake to Nova Scotia. I also continued finding great satisfaction in working on political issues. During this period, my friend to William Morris phoned frequently with various offers but none were terribly interesting. I went to New Mexico for a few weeks to shoot Speechless with Michael Keaton and Gina Davis, and the whole family particularly enjoyed the time we spent together in Point Reyes, just north of San Francisco, while I did a remake of Village of the Damned. One film, a project for HBO called Above Suspicion, took me once again into the world of the disabled. I played a police officer who sustains a bullet wound and becomes a paraplegic. So it went until the spring of 95. My good friends, the Hallmies of Hallmark Entertainment, offered me kidnapped in Ireland. Dane and I held each other close one night and decided that Ireland would be a perfect place to conceive our second child. When we returned to Bedford in the fall, I would direct my first project for the big screen a romantic comedy called Tell Me True. Our plans for the year were falling into place beautifully. And then one evening in May, I went downstairs to fill out an entry form. And the following Friday, we were off to Culpeper. During the first few months of 96, the combination of being home with my family, working on political issues, and maintaining my health kept me extremely busy. I was adjusting reasonably well, but in spite of all this activity, I longed for some kind of creative outlet. In early April, Michael Fuchs came to the rescue. He had recently been fired as a result of a shakeup of executives within Time Warner. He had to leave a number of scripts behind, including one called In the Gloaming. And now, even as he was being shown the door, he pitched Gloaming as an ideal project for my directorial debut. In the Gloaming premiered on April 20th, 97. It did respectably in the ratings, but the reviews were extraordinary. So many people who sustain injuries like mine are forced to give up what they love doing most. But I was lucky enough to find another way to do something that it interested me since I was a teenager. The fact that this new venture succeeded so well was just the icing on the cake. We were nominated for five Emmys and won four Cable Ace Awards, including Best Dramatic Special. 
even though I was still in a wheelchair, I'd taken a big step forward. I consider myself extremely fortunate because my schedule is so varied. So many patients have no choice but to become stuck in a routine, which makes it hard for them to be optimistic about the future. But I'm able to travel to visit scientists in their laboratories and hear about progress in research months before the results are published in scientific journals. And thanks to the generosity of groups that hire me for speaking engagements, I've appeared all over the country sharing my experiences and creating more awareness about the disabled. People often ask me what it's like to be confined to a wheelchair. Well, apart from all the medical complications, I would say the worst part of it is leaving the physical world, having to make the transition from participant to observer long before I would have expected. I think most of us are prepared to give up cherished physical activities gradually as we age. The difference is I would have had time to prepare for other ways of enjoying the things I love. But to have it all taken away at age 42 is devastating. As much as I remind myself that being is more important than doing, that the quality of relationships is the key to happiness, I'm actually putting on a brave face. I do believe those things are true, but I miss freedom, spontaneity, action, and adventure more than I can say. When the first Superman movie came out, the most frequently asked question was, what is a hero? My answer was that a hero is someone who commits a courageous action without considering the consequences. Now my definition is completely different. I think a hero is an ordinary individual who finds the strength to persevere and endure in spite of overwhelming obstacles. At UVA in Kessler, I always kept a picture of the Pyramid of Quetzalcoatl in front of me. I would look at the hundreds of steps leading up to the clouds and imagine myself climbing slowly but surely up to the top. I was told by so many experts, doctors, psychologists, physical therapists, other patients, and well-meaning friends and family members, that as time went by, not only would I become more stable physically, but I would become well-adjusted psychologically to my condition. I found exactly the opposite to be true. The longer you sit in a wheelchair, the more the body breaks down and the harder you have to fight against it. The physical world is still very meaningful to me. And while I believe it's true that we are not our bodies, that our bodies are like houses we live in while we're here on Earth, that concept is more of an intellectual construct than a philosophy I can live by on a daily basis. I'm jealous when someone else talks about their recent skiing vacation, when friends embrace each other, or even when Will plays hockey in the driveway with someone else. If someone were to ask me what's the most difficult lesson I've learned from all this, I'm very clear about it. I know I have to give when sometimes I really want to take. It's part of my job as a father now not to cause Will to worry about me. If I were to turn inward and spend my time mourning the past, I couldn't be as close to Matthew and Alexandra two teenagers who naturally need to turn to me for advice. And what kind of a life would it be for Dana if I let myself go and became just a depressed hulk in a wheelchair? All of this takes effort on my part because it's still very difficult to accept the turn my life has taken, all because of one unlucky moment. And now I'm sailing again. But this time we're on the Sea Angel headed for Maine. It's nighttime and I'm at the helm. Down below, Dane and the children are sleeping and we're sailing down the path of a full moon. For a moment, I look behind me, fascinated by the boiling water just astern. When I look even further behind us, our wake has disappeared and there's nothing to show that we were ever there. 
I think this image comes to me out of fear that the best moments of my life are behind me. I look back longingly, hoping that the memories won't disappear. I have to stop this cascade of memories, or at least take them out of the drawer only for a moment, have a brief look and put them back. Reluctantly, I turn away from my fascination with the wake behind us and concentrate on what lies ahead. But now the boat is damaged. I've been injured and we've lost our charts. Everyone is fully alert, gathered together on deck, quietly waiting to see if we can navigate to shore. Off in the distance is a faint flashing light. It could be a buoy, another ship, or the entrance to a safe harbor. We have no way of knowing how far we have to go, or even if we can stay afloat until we get there. We agree to try and to help each other steer. In the morning, if we stay the course, our beloved sea angel will be tied up safely at the dock, and together we'll start walking home.